Etiatua to Mato Kaihanga, Katiaho te Maramatanga mete ora, Iao Kupu Kuro Katimata o Mahi, Kamao te Tika mete Aroha, Metia Kia U Tonu Kia Mato, To Aroha i Roto i Tene Hui Huinga, Baka Ki, Amato Fakaro, Amato Mahi Kato, Eto Wairua Tapu. Amen. Amen. And I'll just translate. God, our creator, when you speak, there is light and life. When you act, there is justice and love. Grant that your love may be present in our meeting, so that what we say and what we do may be filled with your Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> now, just um, to remind everybody that our meeting is being live streamed today, and of course the councillors have access to their agendas and council papers via their iPads. Um, and so that's why you will note that they will be looking at those particular devices. Do we have any apologies? Thank you. Just a notice, I'll, I'll have to pop out to take a phone call about three o'clock. That's five fine. Minutes. Could I have a move for those apologies, please? Thank you, Councillor Sears. Thank you, Councillor uh, Watkins. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Thank you. And um, we have a uh, leave of absence for Councillors O'Keefe and also for Councillor Kerr. Um, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Mayor Hazelhurst. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Thank you. And just a reminder about conflicts of interest. Um, if people um, could be observant and observe the usual protocol for those, please. Now, the minutes of our previous <coughs> meeting have been circulated and need to be confirmed. Could I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Shollam. Thank you, Councillor Sears. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Thank you, Carried. Now, the first item on our agenda is a presentation from the Hastings City Business Association, and I would like to invite um, um, Kev Carter from Community Grants and Anita Alder, General Manager of the Hastings City Business Association, to come forward, please, and Craig Ridderford, Chair of the Hastings City Business Association. Hello, everybody. So a couple of points um, in the presentations in your pack. But I'll leave the main presentation to Anita and Craig, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end. Uh, Tina Koto Katoa. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hazelhurst <coughs> and Nigel and uh, councillors, council members, for having Craig Ridderford, our chairman for the Hastings City Business Association, and myself in council chambers today to report on what we have been doing in the year just past and what we are looking to undertake in the year moving forward. Um, we have provided a report. I believe everyone has that copy. So I will keep it brief and then we'll open for questions. Uh, when I arrived in the position at the Business Association and before implementing a new strategic plan, I took on board the advice of our current staff, our board members, our council advisors, and our members of the association, uh, to see what they were looking from, uh, from me within the role and to see what sort of initiatives and strategies they wanted to keep moving forward and what new strategies and events they would like to implement uh, in the new plan. Uh, from these, these consultations, we created the 2019 to 2020 plan and implemented that. We did a number of uh, events within that. Uh, it was very heavily event-based from the feedback at that time. We started with our member appreciation evening and that was an opportunity to launch our plan and for me to meet some of our members and uh, and launch into what we were going to do. We went through and we hosted a crime prevention uh, meeting to help our businesses deal with crime prevention in the CBD. We attended a hospitality New Zealand trade show where we promoted our Tribune uh, development and East Side uh, for hospitality future investments. 
Agency. We also uh, took a more casual approach to networking at that time. It was decided that our networking uh, systems had uh, fallen short in the year before, been so event focused. So we started a casual out shout fortnightly meeting where owners could get together and discuss their successes and their concerns. We did a November movie night. Uh, it was quite a huge success for the community. It was lovely to see people enjoying themselves and uh, the event was well received. We also undertook the continuance of the night markets. This was an initiative that has been running for, I believe, around eight years uh, in the CBD. And the initial uh, design of the markets was to create a night shopping and in CBD on Thursday nights. Uh, some of the marketing material we used to promote that, we also promoted through radio. Uh, this was the Christmas Grotto that we also had as one of our events, um, including gift wrapping as part of our big retail sale. The Christmas Grotto was also well received by community and especially obviously the young children. Uh, and similarly, it was set up the same as the previous years before my arrival. We introduced the big retail sale, uh, where stores could obviously put out their products for sale for Christmas shopping. And uh, business owners received that well. They uh, commented that they did see an increase in profits on that day. The difficulty we did have with that, however, is the uh, different opening hours from one business to another. We also did a Christmas cracker promotion where we purchased products from our businesses and in return received free airtime on the Hits Breakfast Show uh, where the announcers discussed the businesses and what they had to offer which drew attention directly to the business. More markets. Uh, we did the eight week uh, boot camp in the park. Uh, this was to highlight some of our health um, businesses within the CBD, our gyms, memberships, which quite often get overlooked. And then the Art Deco market and the uh, hamper auction. Throughout the year, we also ran the bulletin, uh, different initiatives to promote the CBD, uh, which was the bulletin radio campaigns and uh, we also tried to implement a coffee initiative in the CBD where all cafes would agree to remove single-use coffee cups. Events postponed, obviously, due to COVID. Uh, we had some of our markets. Our second crime prevention meeting, the container escape, has been put on hold and being reviewed. Uh, the ice, ice rink, since this report was done, has already been run and was a huge success and May Music Month, all acts were booked, but this was cancelled. Uh, when COVID-19 uh, hit, we quickly moved uh, to a different process into business support and recovery. Uh, through lockdown, we ran several buy local print ads and radio campaigns, uh, drawing focus on our members online and other ways in which they were attempting to navigate uh, business within that uh, environment. We updated members on law changes, avenues of financial support, uh, levels of restrictions, and we were also a sounding platform for our members uh, through hardship through that time, whether it be personally or whether it was with their employees or their landlords. Where we could not help, we passed those people on to uh, members within our professional services, which were uh, more apt to deal with certain matters. Throughout my first year, uh, I listened and I watched and I became more familiar with our members, the Hastings CBD economic environment, our business offerings within the CBD and within our membership. And from sharing my observations with the board, our advisors and our members, uh, I suggested a number of changes. Some of the driving forces uh, behind uh, these changes, but not limited to. These are just some of the collateral that we did. 
Um, so some of the driving forces behind the changes, but not limited to, were half of our membership is professional services. Their feedback from that previous plan, the plan that I've just discussed, was they saw very little from their membership and had become somewhat disengaged. Our retail sector hours of operation were not aligning with several historic events that were ongoing, such as night markets. Our retailers were closed during these uh, events. Uh, Art Deco falling under association when we have an Art Deco Trust better equipped to host such events. A heavy focus on events to bring community into town for community enjoyment, which were hugely successful, but with very little buy-in from our members uh, due to perceived uh, irrelevance and not directly driving money into their tills. We also saw a gap in training and support for our members, especially at the SME entry level in the CBD. It was agreed after consultation with the board, our members and our advisors, that we would better serve our members uh, by taking a more direct, targeted business of fo focus uh, that covers all our sectors within our membership whilst allowing some flexibility in the st strategies, initiatives and events that we would run, which is demanded within any business environment regardless of COVID-19. Uh, from here, we created the 2020-2021 uh, plan. Christine, can I switch that over? Very technically challenged I am, so Christine is helping me out on that one. So our aim's there, to be more member-focused and less community-focused. Not because we don't love or support our community, but it's about running events where our community are still engaged, but it's far more business-focused than purely community-focused, because we are a business association, and we need to be able to measure ourselves and what we do. Promote Hastings CBD nationally and internationally. This has been done, and I'm obviously not going into today, through the... Uh, the CBD Marketing Fund, which Council granted us the funding for, and that, once it's been completed, will be reported on, uh, but that ties into that report. Marketing strategies to promote our members, their services and their products, um, direct marketing, focus on enabling members to facilitate new growth through training services, focus on regular quality networking groups and information sharing, offer key mentoring services to our members. So some of the initiatives that we will undertake to achieve this uh, would be we have been doing an overhaul of our website and that now is the landing page for our e-book which has rep replaced the food and wine guide which had ran previously. This allows us to quickly add new businesses, adjust current businesses and remove any businesses that may have moved on. Uh, in the website overhaul, we are looking to become, again, the website will be more of a business tool as opposed to a, a marketing tool to the community, even though it will host what's on in Hastings, our events that are on. But it will be more of a tool where our businesses can go on to access information. And then we use our social media platforms to promote our community presence, uh, which I see as a more fit um, a domain for that. Our marketing campaign, uh, the Heart of Hawke's Bay by local marketing campaign that was done during lockdown, so that has actually already um, been completed. Support, uh, we noticed, obviously I mentioned previously that there was a disengagement from our professional services, which is 50% of our membership base. And <coughs> while we focused on our retail and hospitality, professional services is a completely different beast altogether and it requires a different focus. So what we've attempted to do in our new plan is to provide a little bit more balance in where our funds go. Uh, we are going to be kicking that off with a professional services evening uh, on the, hopefully, 
on the 4th of November at Toy Toy, and we will have a keynote speaker, guest speaker, and a dinner for professional services where we reintroduce our new platforms, new networking, which has more increased frequency of connecting our professional services with our SME within our CBD. So rather than going external, we are looking to focus um, our entry-level businesses with our massive support network in our membership, uh, rather than going outside of that. Uh, that will be in the form of mentoring, um, B2B uh, networks, and uh, training. We've also changed the way in which we will provide our upskilling and training packages. Previously, we were going to do those in person, but all we have seen in the current climate is cancellations of events. So we have quickly switched to a digital online training platform. So therefore, our business owners can access that remotely at any time for themselves or staff to access HR, legal, accounting, and services, fill out a job form, and then ask for further information, hence reconnecting them with our professional services. We are still going to be event focused. Uh, we have retail and hospitality as a large, obviously 50% as well, and the professional services falling under beauty and health. So therefore we still are working on our container escape. There have been changes in that. We are currently working with two local people who are looking to open an escape room, and we are working on finding them a site and joining together with the puzzle that we currently own to create a new business for Hastings CBD which was the end goal of that initiative in the beginning. The City Ice Rink was held on the 1st, the 10th of July. Um, I would really like to see this become a biannual event. Uh, the community absolutely loved it. It was professionally run. It was a simple event to run, and it actually generated a lot of funds that we obviously didn't plan for. So moving forward, it would be actually a less cost-effective way to run a great community event. Annually would be too much, and I, I believe it would become stale. Uh, the Blossom Festival, we're, we're looking to, from the association, more to work with other agencies as opposed to doubling up. So with the Blossom Festival, instead of putting the onus on the business members to create a window display, we have set aside some funding to participate with decoration of the windows so that the Blossom Festival and the business owners may meet in the middle and... Uh, work better on that event. Bay Plaza Family Fun Day. We will be uh, doing an activity at Bay Plaza um, because it does often get overlooked when we run things in town. The December Christmas Cracker promotion will still go ahead. It was an excellent tool for uh, putting a spotlight on individual businesses and showcasing what Hastings CBD has to offer. Um, locally. Our tourism, we are working on, this is where the flexibility comes in, we obviously have funding and quite often we will run an event and we might have some surplus, so therefore we will push this into our tourist events once that reopens. <coughs> Things like the cycle recycle tour of all our uh, eclectic uh, second hand stores within the CBD, uh, the degustation tour we are looking to do an international food tour in the end of February, which will highlight the fact that even though East is our food, Eat Street, Hastings CBD has a very eclectic and full, vibrant uh, world restaurant market in there. So we're going to do a, a walking food tour. So still event-focused, just in a different way. Some of our beautiful and amazing offerings in, in Hastings uh, and definitely still growing there. And that you don't need to look at. That's probably going to put you all to sleep on a Thursday <laughs> afternoon. So should we just we'll go past that, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Bruce got very excited. There were numbers. Um, so, yes, uh, I, obviously you've got the more detailed approach. Uh, I know there has been a lot of conversation around the changes in events and I just want to stress that the, the reason for the changes are to better serve the members and to make sure that we're not only ticking 
one box, which is vibrancy, but we're also making sure that we're looking after our other sectors, professional services, um, beauty services, and, um, and hospital. So just trying to take a broader approach with a very small amount of money. So any questions? Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair. Thank you um, for your presentation. If I just talk about events, in my view, the one event that brought a level of panache, aligned us to our Spanish Mission and Art Deco for a whole day, where people came into the city to spend money, was that Art Deco. And I see you have to, you know, there's a change of direction, but to me, that was an event that just wrapped itself around the businesses of Hastings and what Hastings stands for in our outward facade and how we present ourselves. So if you're pulling out of that space, have you had conversation with the Art Deco Trust or other people who are going to make sure that stays in Hastings? Because that was an incredible event. Yes, and, and I 100% agree with you. In fact, to be honest, my year would be a lot better if I ran, just continued with those events because they are so fun. And I get a massive reward out of working with the community. However, I wasn't answering the objectives of my business association. But to answer the question, yes, we have reached out and they, uh, the Art Deco Trust have emailed us. They've asked for the complete uh, vendor list from the day, the run sheet of how we did it, and the budget. So they are looking to continue that. And I also know, uh, Councillor, that, that they have been in touch with the Common Room and Gerard and the restaurants to also do extra events outside of the Art Deco um, market. I certainly will be following up on that and making sure that those types of events are still here. The reason we pulled out of Art Deco wasn't because we don't want it, so we would still look to push that through and keep it going and do anything we can from the association to support that. Partner with them. Yeah, we'll partner with them. Yeah. Okay, look, look, thank you for that. And, and could I just ask one other question? I think we had a discussion around the table maybe a year or so ago about some funding for Art Deco, and we made a tag that it must relate to events here in Hastings. And I think we just should follow that up, considering that the Business Association... Are... Yeah, so that's been, that's been followed up. Uh, we've had a few meetings with Art Deco, and there'll definitely be some Art Deco um, yeah, festival here. More Art Deco festival than, than previously. Councillor Nixon. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Anita, um, it's obviously been a pretty tough year for... Um, a lot of businesses, retailers, CBD retailers particularly. I'm not sure if you've seen our agenda, but we have a, an item later on about um, how we might be able to help you know, the business community generally. I'm interested in your comments, if any, uh, connected with your you know, disconnect with the professional services, as to whether you see part of your role as, as sort of providing assistance, advice, connections to your own members rather than just being a, like a marketing organisation, which a lot of what you put up has been of that order. Um, and I can't quite understand how the professional services have become so disengaged in these difficult times. And I would have thought uh, this was the very time that, that through the business association, they could be really connecting with the rest of your members to provide the advice and services that are needed. So it's, it's not so much a question, it's a comment, but could you comment on my comment? I'll try. Um, I could only go on when you sit in the role, and for the first year I tried not to change too much, or I came in pretty fresh with no opinion. Uh, and it was more interacting within that membership where I found the disengagement was. And the disengagement came originally because the association had become heavily event-focused, and that was through the vibrancy period. So the focus had become on running things that were contributing to the vibrancy of the CBD, which are relevant. But we'd gone, like anything, we'd gone a little bit too far into that, and we hadn't balanced the seesaw. So if I spoke to Peter Hensman from 
Shepherd Hensman, or if I spoke to Mandy at Grow HR, or even Craig from BWR, is that there wasn't anything that we were doing that had a direct tangible outcome for them. Like if we ran a retail promotion, the retailers would say, yes, that was great, our profits went up or down. So we had, in the association, missed the boat a little bit with our personal connection with those, with those members. And so what it is is re-establishing that we are here and we're focusing on them and connecting them through the, uh, the mentoring systems and the B2B so that our retailers in Costco know that they can actually connect with our professional services and vice versa. And that's part of our role to do. We do get people contact us. Um, I've worked with numerous business owners already through the last year that's not in that presentation because that's obviously confidential to the names of people who have the businesses. Uh, where I've put them onto professional services or we've assisted them directly from in-house. Uh, for one example, we have sent one over to CoStar in Napier because that was relevant to them. So I think for us, it's just more making sure that when we get that funding that comes through to us, if 50% of that is paid to us by the professional services, that after our next year, they turn around and say, we actually, that was relevant to us. We actually saw a result from that. So whether it's through our digital training library, where BWR are already going to do a video um, training, uh, what would you call it, gosh, um, platform from their perspective. We already have Grow HR doing video training. We have uh, Taxel. We have a number of them. So there should be about 30 short videos that members can access, which highlights their businesses and highlights what they have to offer. So I think it's more, if that's answered the question, I need to reconnect and gain their confidence and trust back that I'm also here to work for them. So at that point, once we've done that, then they might say, we would like you to do this or now we'd like you to do that, and then we'd take a different direction. Yeah, thank you for the answer. In the current environment, it seems like uh, that's an activity that, that maybe you need to uh, yeah, concentrate on a little more because it, yeah, it's important that businesses survive and it's important that they, they have the best possible advice, and if it's available within your own membership, uh, that has benefits to both sides of the equation. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Hazelhurst. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Craig and Anita uh, for their incredibly hard work recognising um, the, the challenges and reacting to the challenges post-COVID. Um, I think your marketing campaigns are professional and quite sensational. I am Hastings. The, the level of videos uh, and just the engagement and I understand that the very, very tight uh, rope you walk between looking after professional business and retail and events. But actually, what you've done in terms of the vibrancy of the CBD, you can't put a cost on that. You can't say this is a bottom line for these businesses. Our city is a different city today. Uh, it is vibrant. It is People are out there. They, they even know... Um, these aren't the easiest times. The events like the ice skating rink that you created, bringing people together to actually have something to enjoy and feel proud of uh, with our city is a huge part of what you do, and you do it very well. And I just wish to take this opportunity to thank you. Because, you know, no, no offence here, Craig, but our accountants and our lawyers will sit in their, in their offices and they will do what they do, and they'll do it well. But if our people are proud of their CBD, you guys need to take some credit for that because it feels safe, it feels vibrant, people are smiling. And all of that we do together. You can't do it all on your own with your membership base. We can't do it all as a council because we rely on you providing these things. So, you know, everything isn't just about providing bottom line, it's also providing a sense of well-being for our community and thank you for your support with that. Kia ora. Councillor Sears. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment, if I might. Um, oh, and of course, um, acknowledging Māori Language Week. Kia kaha, te reo Māori. Um, yes, I wanted to, um, uh, as the Mayor's already said, um, acknowledge the marketing campaign. I think it's been fantastic, really noticeable. I've been 
very impressed, so thank you for that. Um, and a small thing, um, the attempt to remove the coffee cups, I just really want to acknowledge that because I think building on environmental pictures is really important for our CBDs. Over 20 million coffee cups were saved from landfill during our lockdown in New Zealand, 20 million. It's huge, and I think if that's an initiative that you can have another go at, I'd be very supportive of that, so thank you. Councillor Shalom. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too uh, would like to take a moment to recognise the, the work of the Business Association, um, the Board and you, Anita. Um, uh, Councillor Harvey and I are both advisors on the Board and we get to see firsthand um, <coughs> the passion and effort that's put into uh, what the Association does. Um, I would particularly like to commend the Board on um, its bravery around realigning the focus of the Business Association. It's a hard thing to do when uh, there are established events that everyone loves, but perhaps aren't delivering what your members are paying their targeted rate for. Um, uh, it was bold and you are seeing return, and I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate that you are looking for ways um, to still bring vibrancy to our CBD through initiatives like the ice rink, but also making sure that they're aligned to tangible business outcomes for your members through the advertising um, and general promotion around the CBD. So thank you for your efforts in that area. Uh, my question for you is, um, since you are our main conduit to our CBD uh, business community, is there anything that we can be doing to better support our members in these trying times? Where's council? Well, I could always turn to my right and ask Bruce for more money. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a hard sell. <laughs> um, look, to be honest, and not just to flatter, I, I think the Hastings District Council and the councillors are doing an incredible job, uh, especially when we compare that to other areas. I have a business in the South Island. I'm under the Selwyn Council, and I can say there's been zero support, zero marketing campaigns, zero anything relating. So I think uh, Mayor Hazelhurst and, and Nigel have done a tremendous job and you as councillors for giving us the funding for the CBD marketing campaign. Uh, that was a game changer for us and it allowed us to stretch our legs a little bit and not be so thinking about those Craig looking over my shoulder at how much we'd spent. But um, the stage two of that campaign actually comes out uh, in the next week. So that campaign hasn't finished. There's another call to action and then there's a, another incentive uh, just so we can keep that momentum going. And it switches, uh, LJ switches it back to the community this time and asks, what, you, what have you discovered? And then they have to share that to, to go in the draw to win a vacation. So that marketing campaign fund has been uh, really instrumental in the CBD. And again, also with what Rachel uh, Stewart and her department are doing, the place is looking beautiful, um, finalist in most beautiful big town, big town. And um, but also what you've done in Eastside, that alone for the hospitality sector, that is a game changer again to have those extra spaces uh, with Tribune coming up and the support also there. And with um, Andrea Tafes, with the work she's doing with the light installations. I think there's great things happening, so I think just keep doing what you're doing and, and our role is to, after it's been a year, I need to start working more closely with other agencies external to council as well to make sure that I'm not overlapping and, and keeping those doors open, I think. Um, a follow-up question, if I might, Madam Chair. Um, I recognise that within the, um, the report and within your annual plan um, and, and overall report for marketing plan, um, you noticed, uh, you noted that it's uh, important to remain agile, particularly at the moment. Um, do you feel you've got that agility? Uh, I think there's definitely work which we're in discussions with at the moment with uh, council regarding KPIs and how they align with the difficulties of taking the rate of levy uh, and with the annual plans and the changes that we're putting through. But I see really positive things coming from that and I have a very supportive board who also are backing me as well in those changes but because they're, they're honestly coming from the members so um, I think I think we do yeah I think that the ability to be flexible and I did um, hope I'm not throwing Bruce under the bus but we had a light conversation last week and I did say about the flexibility with 
when you do a budget coming from private sector, when it's so tightly held that the money is on that specific event, it allows for little flexibility when things change. So thankfully, as you'll see on the last plan, is a lot less detailed. But we will add into that constantly. There's still things that we will do um, as we rethink the wheel throughout the year because it's going to be an interesting, you know, five years ahead. So we'll just keep plugging away. So I think, yes, I do um, have, have the support I need. I think everyone's listening and we're all working towards the same goal. Excellent. Well, my thanks to the, the council team that's involved in that then. Um, and very happy to move the recommendations. Thank you. Could I have a second, please? Thank you, Mayor Hazelhurst. I'll put those three recommendations on the bottom of page nine. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, Carried, and thank you, Anita and Craig, for your attendance. Now, item number five is the uh, Horse of the Year draft statement of intent and annual report. I acknowledge the um, presence in the chamber of Sophie Blake, who is here to answer questions uh, should they arise. Um, and I'll get you to speak to that, Bruce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Sophie. Uh, this report um, is for you uh, to make comment on the statement of intent as it's been presented. Um, and, and last year's uh, financial results. There has been a number of discussions regarding the course of the year, and more recently we received um, the annual plan um, and annual report um, from an event perspective um, from Mr Aitken. And um, Mr Aitken uh, puts his apologies, um, and he would like to have been here, but it's an auction this week. So, so thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. Now everyone can hear me, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go through every single final page of it because that's obviously, once again, not exactly the most exciting thing to read. But we had a great um, result this year, a positive surplus of after all the sort of um, event expenses coming out of 89,000. Um, that's it's for, for how our show has been for the last few years, that's actually a good result for us. Um, so we're quite we're very confident moving forward that we'll be able to build um, on our equity and become sustainable, which has been our biggest battle for so many years. So through this con, you know, continuous support of Hastings Council, which is greatly received, um, the five-year commitment from Land Rover, which is, as we speak, being signed. Um, I shouldn't say it too soon, but it's, um, it hasn't been signed yet, but the conversation is for a five-year commitment. Um, and we're very, very grateful to receive the Domestic Event Fund. Um, that's given us certainty and confidence that we can move forward. Um, we, we bring over six million to the district and for this event not to go ahead would be um, quite critical in so many suppliers, small suppliers, from, gosh, from toilets to furniture to so many things. Um, so we're extremely grateful for the Domestic Event Fund. Um, the event surplus, um, and, and also obviously the, the the, the new one is the event surplus that is made or will be made this year, <laughs> being positive, it remains in our books. So it remains in Hawke's Bay, it remains in our books, which means we can invest back into the show. Um, is there any questions on our financials that you want further information on? That's an easy one. <laughs> okay, and we'll go over to the um, statement of intent. Um, this is very much the draft. Um, I've just flipped through it and just seen a couple of errors, but that's, that's a draft. Um, so the main thing, we obviously had a big change on this year is our risk and our, um, sort of trying to eliminate risks like COVID and that kind of thing. Um, I won't read through this one either because I'm sure you've all read through it. Have you got any amendments or suggestions or something you'd like change to it? That's quite, that's quite, but no. I'll just, I'll just put that aside too. Yeah. Just, right. just a question from me. I'm somewhat um, curious mm -hmm. as to how you're going to go about organising things given that our border is going to be closed because I note the significant input you have had from international yes. competitors in the past. Yep. So we haven't actually had, um, the last few years, we haven't actually had international riders as such. So we've got an international presence. We have an international recognition from FEI and CDI, which is your equestrian international level. 
we're still doing that. Um, eventing, which is one of our, I suppose you could say, our show, that's, our, that's our star, the Sky TV and all that. We've got dispensation to run that as an inter international event. You're using, they, they call it regional international officials. So eventing, um, FEI has recognised that there will be no borders and we don't want to be the show that brought COVID back to the country. Um, so we're going to be doing an internationally recognised regional, when I say regional, I mean New Zealand national event. So we're still going to, we're just touring up the idea, we're, we're, we're battling a little bit with um, dressage FEI. Um, they haven't quite seen the need to drop that um, dispensation yet, but they are always the latest one to do. So we're, we're capitalising on the fact that a lot of our international riders that would have been going to the Olympics or things like that are actually here. Um, so we're probably going to be looking at, the, at a bigger field of international, what, I, what we class, you've got international riders that flew over or internationally recognised riders. So our international owned riders will be in the country still. So we're going to capitalise on what um, amazing sports, you know, sportsmen people that we have in the country. So we're going to turn it around and make it how amazing and amazingly big we are in New Zealand. Yeah, Hazelhurst. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Sophie, uh, for your presentation and the work that you're doing the course of the year. A um, couple of things. Is it $200,000 from the Domestic Event Fund? 187. 187. Yeah. Fantastic. Congratulations. How do you see, um, how does Horse of the Year see that they will use those funds? It's pretty much to give us certainty. Um, it was actually, to be totally honest with you, when I was filling out the form, I was kind of crystal balling it because we had just come off the back of a very successful show. Um, and the effects, I personally think the effects to the um, to a summer event hadn't really sunk in, and we had huge uptake of trade. We were look, we were like way ahead of 20, 2021 was way ahead of 20. So I was filling out this form, going, I'm crystal balling this, and now it's a reality. So our tr we've still we saw it a part of last year, but the uncertainty is now setting in, and it just means we don't have to make rational decisions like. We are a premier show and we want to get these category sponsors, but we don't want to go, we're so desperate for your money, we'll drop down from a 40k to a 20k sponsorship. So it's giving us the confidence to be able to hold our own, keep, you know, keeping it premier, keeping it to the level we want to. Um, and it, yeah, just the confidence at the bottom line won't get hurt so much. It also gives us confidence to pay the likes of AMP or some of our suppliers up front that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so much uncertainty, but we're we're confident that it'll be, it's our safe net. It's just given us certainty to move forward. Great, thank you. Just a final question. Um, in terms of the KPIs, um, and I just think for the, you know, for next year's show, um, given that the people of Hastings are, are the largest sponsor of Horse of the Year, uh, I think that it's what I'd like to see included from it, with you, with our events team, uh, the opportunity to showcase and mm. present Hastings in a much stronger light than we've seen in the past. Absolutely. And uh, that is very, very important to us. It's a very important ex um, accessibility also uh, that, pe that, our, that our community can visit the show. It's, a, it's an impressive show for people who are not even uh, equestrian minded, uh, just to, to have the opportunity to visit. And, and we've got a great opportunity now with, you know, we've been in this partnership together for a very long time, uh, but it has to be Hastings, yeah. and it has to be um, loud and proud, uh, and and we have to make sure that, you know, we are telling the Hastings story with Horse of the Year, um, Hastings Horse of the Year, just putting it out there. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> couldn't, yeah couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, had a very exciting... It, wasn't, it was just an initial meeting with Hawkesbury Tourism. Um, I've also had another meeting with Sky and that kind of thing that I keep on telling them. It's not about a five-day show. It's about a week lead-up. So we want to do showcasing of you know, sort of um, the event leading up. But everyone we talk to now, it's all about, we keep on saying about the Hastings. Like we're currently at the moment redesigning the website and um, all of our marketing sort of um, platforms. And I've got to get it to the marketing team yet. Um, but even, the logo will be everywhere. Things like making sure we do video activations with iconic Hastings places, um, promoting the young little girl from you know, a Hastings school that dreams to be at the show. We might get like a job pageant just drop on in her stable or something. So just, we are definitely um, wanting to bring it back to the community and just bring the culture back. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. I think, thank you. Through you, Chair. Look, I don't like repeating what another... Um, person has said round the table, but I, I am going to this time, because Hastings 
is the word that's got to get out there. And I look right through this report, and I can't see the word Hastings anywhere. It's all Hawke's Bay. So it's got to be Hastings, Hastings, Hastings. Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, three recommendations on page 12. Sorry? I'm vaping, sorry. Councillor Barber. Kia <coughs> I'll support the last two speakers uh, around the Hastings um, branding. But just, um, just around the COVID risk, mm -hmm. um, does the board, I mean, have they, have they made any kind of bottom lines uh, as of yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, so what we're doing is we've, um, well, I'm lucky I'm the finance person as well. Um, I'm running a constant um, COVID scenario against the um, ideal budget, and we have got a, we've got a, a, a risk factor at the bottom that at any, at any certain time, if we get to a point that the um, liability is going to affect our balance sheet for 22, um, we've got two key points, 1st of October and 1st of February. The reason we brought those dates out to make the final decision, to make the call, is the 1st of October is when our first big invoices start going out to um, supply sponsors. So that's when our real money starts coming in. We don't want to receive it if we don't, aren't going to go ahead. We, now that we've got the domestic event fund, that kind of outweighs that. Um, then the 1st of February one is when we pretty much hire Paul and all those guys start packing 3rd of February. Once that truck's packed, we're we're in for it. So um, we can only eliminate, not eliminate, that's, that's a bit naive, but um, we can only assist our COVID expenses up to then because after that the government takes control over it. There are quite a few things we're putting in place. Um, the trade people, for example, the 20% they pay will be held through to the 22 as a deposit. Um, what we're doing with our marketing and our sponsorship, mainly industry-based, is that we're trying to do as many deliverables for the lead-up to the show. That's what the feedback we've had from the sponsors, that they want more lead-up. So they'll be doing like all the EDMs, all the Facebook posts. That's all pre-show. So every contract that goes out, we have a percentage of what's actually payable regardless of the show going ahead. Because a lot of our sponsors want coverage. They don't care about the five, six days that their signs around the Premier Arena. That's actually not what they want. So we've got a um, we've got a non non show go ahead budget, and it, none of it makes it look like a loss. We're not willing to take a hit, um, and in any year we can do that. That'll be this year. We're not going to hurt our final you know balance sheet that's finally looking good, well not great, but looking and you know, it's not in the red. Um, we've got quite a few things in place to yeah battle that. Thank you. Our three recommendations on page. 12. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Watkins. And a seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. I'll put those recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? <coughs> Carried. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much. I'm now going to invite our financial controller to come forward. Um, before, before he presents uh, the financial results, I think we, we need to put these in the context of where we are in the world and in this time in history. So I'm sure I don't need to remind people that we are reporting in what is probably the most adverse economic conditions for a century, um, and it is certainly worse than anything that any of us will have seen in our lifetime. So that, that given, um, I think we can congratulate our finance staff on the excellence of their work, um, and then I'll let the results speak for themselves. Thanks, Aaron. Just before I hand over to Aaron, just, yeah. just by way of some context, I mean, um, it is unprecedented times and all that context is right. Um, but, you know, from, from my perspective as the Chief and with the officers, it's still disappointing that we didn't um, break even. I mean, that was what we were looking to do and what we'd flagged um, to the Council. I mean, clearly, um, I think some of the results in terms of the impact on both revenue and the costs that we incurred in a COVID context is the context that we're operating in. But one of the things that we've committed to do is a lead team, because there are... Um, you know, the opportunity of, of just taking a stand back and having a look at, well, did, 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 did we get everything, did we control everything we possibly could have in terms of the fiscals is something that we're intending, well, intending to do over the next month and we will bring back um, to this committee because I think um, it's, it's worth holding the mirror up and asking that question of ourselves. Whilst, you know, this has occurred within the context of, 
on COVID COVID nineteen. So just want to acknowledge up, up front that you know, it, despite that context, it's still disappointing to um, obviously be recording um, a death deficit, albeit in you know un, an unprecedented um, year. Um, good afternoon. Um, yes, it's interesting also that the GDP um, number came out uh, this morning. That was a 12.2% uh, um, fall, which is obviously one of the biggest falls in the history of, of New Zealand, but better than what they were originally forecasting. And we're obviously operating in that environment um, um, currently. Um, just before we um, get into the actual results themselves, I'd just like to um, differentiate between um, the accounting result and the management reports that we uh, see every quarter as well, along with the rating result, which we have um, in, this, in this presentation. So the um, statutory um, reports is the one that we do uh, with the annual report. It includes, uh, it's against the annual plan, and so it doesn't include any of the carry forwards uh, any of the adjustments for um, NZTA uh, funding and that sort of thing and spend, whereas our revised budgets under the management reports actually do all that um, and give us a much more operational uh, view of what's actually happening there. In terms of rating result, um, it's all around the cash. So um, what that does is it ignores the um, development contributions and the non-cash um, adjustments that usually happen for um, accounting purposes such as vested assets um, and so forth and depreciation. So the, the rating result is really how much money have we got left over in terms of cash. This next um, slide here is to do with the draft accounting result as a statutory reporting, um, one that goes into our uh, annual report. Um, audit still here at the moment. Uh, they've, they've just left, but they're still auditing our accounts. So that will go on for another two or three weeks. Uh, there may be changes to that. We we wait their feedback and and um, make adjustments accordingly. Um, what we're looking at here is that after the UNRWA, uh, the net surplus uh, deficit after uh, swaps is 1.435 million that you see there. Um, that's not a bad result, but what it does include is the big accounting movements um, that, that happen that swing that, that number. We'll get down to the more operating revenue and expenditure shortly. Um, on top of that, we had um, a $35.9 million, uh, million um, gain in revals, um, revaluation. So we had a water, uh, three waters revaluation this year, and that uh, caused an uplift in, in, in the assets by around $40 million. We also uh, took the opportunity to impair the Heritonga House by 5.2 million uh, due to the fact of some advice with audits and conversations there around the fact that A, we weren't using the building, B, we couldn't lease it out. The value then had to reflect what the true value of the building is now and the fact that it's going to be some time before we can actually um, uh, know more around, you know, have more information um, supplied. So revenue uh, for the year um, was up around that um, 5.3.8 million dollars, and um, what that showed is that, especially in the first nine months, that we were, due to the strong uh, economic activity, we're, we're doing quite well. Yes, we were getting impacted on the expenditure side, but we were also, um, you know, uh, uh, getting uh, quite strong revenues. Um, the, the last part there, that, that June um, uplift that you see, uh, is really due to the accounting adjustments that come in right at the end. What I wanted to do was just have a, uh, a bit of a closer look at what would happen uh, if we didn't have COVID on a revenue stream that's really cash-based, and that's our, our fees and charges. So what we're saying here is... Um, the green, the green bars that you see are our actuals for the year, month on month. And then they were around 14% ahead of budget for the first nine months. So when we looked at that, we looked at what actually happened in the last three months in relation to budget to those actuals. And what happened was that um, the April figures actually went 17% lower than budget. 
um, the, the May went, fell 4%, and then it came back up 6% above budget. So um, having a look at that and extrapolating those numbers, we said, what would happen if we actually took COVID impact out and replaced it with the average that we've been ahead all for the first nine months across the full year? And that's what those, um, those uh, orange uh, amounts are. So 664K is effectively what we lost approximately in revenue by having COVID hitting us in terms of the lockdown. 322k in, in May and around 157 in June. Now, why I mention this is because that's a 1.1 million dollar number we left on the table that we couldn't help. And in, in that sense, that 1.1 million dollars for fees and charges actually then directly relates and affects the rating result, which at the moment was a is, is a 269k loss. But if we'd actually not been affected by COVID, it could have been quite a different result. It's just something to, to bear in mind when we're going through these results because um, it, it, it clearly had quite, quite an effect on those. In terms of expenditure, expenditure um, was well over. Um, $7.9 million of that was to do with accounting um, adjustments and around $5 million was to do with more operating um, effects. And I'll just show that on my next um, screen here. So um, what we had here was we had $2 million over in personnel costs. Now, uh, most of that was baked into the first nine months of, of this year because of the fact that we had really high um, activity demand and we were responding to that demand. Some of that is offset in the additional revenue uh, that we received in those fees and charges, even though they were impacted by COVID. Um, and some of that was to do also with um, the uh, higher uh, health and safety and rostering costs around pools and community services as well. Depreciation was $2.8 million ahead of um, at more, more than budget. Uh, remembering that what happens there is that we had a large depreciation, a, a large revaluation in our assets from the prior year, and there's a lag as to when uh, the budget is done. So the budget is done before the reval, and so we don't actually know exactly what that revaluation number is going to be. Um, so we're looking at ways to actually uh, take the effect down and take the effects out of that uh, going forward. The uh, finance costs were $1.7 million uh, lower uh, under budget. Uh, that's probably reflective of the fact that we didn't fully spend our um, entire capital um, spend uh, in, in the current year. Other operating costs were impacted by um, a number of factors. Also, there were, as you've probably seen in the report, uh, some uh, approved but unbudgeted spend. So the costs will show up here. Some of those offsets um, have been uh, accounted for in terms of the funding of them. For instance, we had $491,000 worth of direct COVID costs, which was funded out of the uh, contingency reserve. Um, and that, of course, is, is, is as a, as a expenditure impact is, is factored into these, these operating costs. We also had um, the fire, the opera, the Toy Toy fire, which has been going over the last probably 18 months or so. Um, that again, we got a reimbursement through the insurance proceeds and the, and the revenue side. So the fire hasn't been going for 18 months. The remediation of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I sincerely hope not. <laughs> um, in terms of the accounting adjustments, uh, that's where the uh, the loss on unrealised loss on swaps is, uh, along with um, any, any disposal of infrastructure loss um, sits in there as well. In terms of capital spend, um, we didn't make the budget, as you can see there, we were quite a way under it. However, what's fascinating is that $76 million spend, which we actually did achieve during the year, um, was still ahead, even with COVID impacts um, in that last quarter, um, was still um, quite well ahead of uh, the previous two years, which you can see in the uh, blue line there and also the yellow line. Just breaking that uh, capital spend down a little bit more, um, this is a comparison between um, the prior year and the current year. And so you can see that the renewals are looking after our assets. Um, we spent um, quite a bit more this year in relation to last year, 41 million versus the 34 mil. Um, we had uh, improving levels of service new works. Um, we were around the similar amount of um, spenders last year. 
and they're meeting the additional um, spend we've just slightly, just slightly over, but you know, there or thereabouts. External debt grew to $152 million from $106 million last year. Um, I think um, what's quite good about showing this over the years is the increasing uh, levels of debt. Um, that's in response, obviously, to the water uh, spend that we've done. Also, um, big projects like Toy Toy uh, Municipal uh, are all kicking into that as well. Um, so it, it does show the effect on, on debt as, as the spend goes up, so does, so does funding for it. When you break that debt down by activity uh, for the year, you can see um, the, the, the related activities that are actually um, starting to show out. When you add the uh, stormwater, the wastewater and the water supply together, you're, you're around 49-50% of the total debt uh, is in those areas. Um, you can see the Opera House toy toy is, is, is starting to show out the areas of parks and sports grants. Debt measures, so even though our debt, debt has increased to 152 mil, um, what you can see there is that we're still um, well within uh, many of those debt measure limits. Um, the interest income is, is um, relatively low, the interest to rates is relatively low, um, and the debt to income is probably the one that, well, it's well under 150%. As debt rises, um, we just need to watch that because it may rise, the debt may rise faster than the actual income rises um, um, due to the limitations of, of how we get our, our, our revenue streams. Just moving to the rating result. So as alluded to before, the rating result um, was a negative result in terms of a $338,000 loss. That split between, um, oh, sorry, a $269,000 um, loss. That split between rating area one and rating area two. Rating area one was a $338,000 um, loss and rating area two was a $68,000 surplus. And part of that is, is, is uh, the reason is due to the way um, the splits between RA one and two occur. RA um, two tended to have more favourable surplus in the remissions and penalties area, whereas RA1 um, tended to get hit mainly by the operational um, uh, demand, higher operational demand and, and costs um, that were over in the area. In terms of landfill uh, surplus, this year it was a $1.64 million uh, surplus. Um, last year, what we did was we um, <coughs> allocated 1.052 million to the uh, curbside collections reserve. And for the RA2, we um, put $151,000 to the flood reserve there. So in terms of recommendations, uh, on the 7th of September, uh, our, the RCB uh, met, the Rural Community Board uh, met, and their recommendations to council were uh, that of the $68,000 general rate surplus uh, that relates to RA2, that $60,000 of that go to the um, allocated to the flood and emergency reserve, and $8,375 uh, be allocated to the rural security um, camera trial. In terms of the landfill surplus, that $125,000 of that go to the capital reserve. They have a number of large spends coming up uh, in the next few years. Uh, and $81,000 be allocated to repaying the Omarinui uh, gas plant debt. So just a, a note on that, as, as was um, stated in the report, um, that particular asset was sold, we had a debt with that asset, and now we're just uh, uh, repaying that debt, um, of which 81000 is RA2's uh, portion of it. Overall, the recommended... Um, the rate, uh, you know, the rating and the landfill surplus allocation. So, just going um, through those. The first, the first is around addressing the RA1 general purpose reserve, which was, as as we've seen, a three hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollar loss. What we are uh, advocating there is that that be funded from the general purpose reserve for which there are funds. Uh, for the for the uh, rating area two's uh, surplus on the general rate, 
uh, as has been described before, the flood reserve and also the allocation to the rural security, uh, security camera trial. The landfill surplus, uh, the first um, order of the day there was to repay the debt. But that was a total of $646,000 sep uh, split out between uh, rating area one, which is a $564,000 share of that debt, and rating area two, which is an $81,000 uh, um, portion. The, the rest of the landfill surplus, um, obviously we've talked about RA2 being going to a capital reserve, that's for that 125. The RA1, um, it's been recommended that uh, actually we, we build up the contingency reserve considering that we've had to use it, um, considering that we don't know what the first six months of next year, this, this current financial year is gonna be like, and we don't know actually where a lot of that, that is headed. Um, it would be probably prudent to um, put that money aside just to make sure that we have some money to, if, if should, should we need that. In terms of carry forwards, this year it was uh, $32 million carry forwards. Um, the effect of that uh, deficit, by the way, in, in the rating um, result was to reduce the number of projects that were rates funded that were going to be carry forward. So they got, they got that, that's the, the the downside or the effect of not having um, a surplus or a break even is that you then start to cut projects uh, that are going to be carried forward back in terms of the rate, the ones that are affected by rates. Um, last year we had a $40 million carry forward. Um, this year it's down to $32 million, um, and that's what's uh, recommended. I think the full list is in the back as an attachment, uh, the breakdown of that. And so that's the recommendations um, that carry forward to be approved as well. Any questions? Councillor Nixon. Yeah, pretty comprehensive. Um, I was thinking about the unrealised uh, swaps, the effective loss. It's not, it can't be realised at the moment, 5.2 million. Um, and the two questions I've got relating to that are how long does that spread over in the future? And to what extent would interest rates need to change to eliminate that? Yeah, so um, just, just going back to swaps and just, just uh, taking that back a step. So effectively, your swaps are like an insurance. Yeah. So when you take out the $10 million line, and you go, that's for 15 years or five years or eight years, whatever the, the spread is, then you say, okay, is it likely that those interest rates are going to go up or are they going to go down? And so what you do is you take a swap out if you think it's going to go up, and then if it goes up, you don't get affected, so uh, you don't get affected by that impact as it's going up. However, the downside of a swap is that when it's a floating rate and the, 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 we've had some structural changes in the last three or four years, and the rates start to drop, then um, theoretically um, what you owe, if you were to realise the position, and we are not realising the position, is the amount that shows up on the balance sheet. So what last year it was a $7.088 million um, unrealised loan. <coughs> this year it's uh, around a 5.19 um, number. So, um, and those swaps are taken out of, uh, were taken out, over quite a long number of years, like you probably eight, 10 years. So they take a long time to work their way out. Now, in terms of um, that being said, you, uh, when you talk to bankers and say, can we, can, we, how, how do, can we actually opt out of that position? Is there any way we can adjust that? The only way they will tell you to do that is to blend the swap with another swap. All you're doing is kicking the ball down the road and you don't actually understand what is down the road, that's what offering it. So what you're better to do is just um, don't realise it and just sit on it and eventually the valuation will come back over the time as those swaps work their way out of the system. That's my understanding of how they work. So if I ask the question in a different way, next year and say in five years' time, what would that figure look like? So theoretically, as the swaps drop off, yeah. they should start to, to, to having peaked <coughs> start to drop, drop down. Yeah. That comes down, though, to uh, a number of factors. It comes down to whether interest rates drop. Um, 
not to get too complicated, but when the interest, if, if the, um, the, the bank rate goes below a zero and becomes negative, that has a different effect on swaps. And when you talk to bankers, they'll give you all sorts of ideas actually what's going to happen. So they're not fully, they're, they're waiting to see what actually happens. The calculations are really get really, really complex at that point. I asked the question, I thought I knew exactly what I was talking about. Now I'm <laughs> to wonder. So I think, I think in, in short, um, so last year the adjustment was seven million, this year it's five. I think we're not seeing interest rates declining much lower than what they are now. It's, it's not that physically possible unless it, until they go negative. Um, so the, the reduction in rates, um, we're not going to see declining much further than what they already are. So we would expect that those adjustments to get smaller as the years go on. We haven't taken on swaps in recent years, or at least in the last 12 months. That, um, so the, we're, we're slowly blending away um, the swaps that we had in place. So you'd expect those adjustments to get smaller. Will do. Thank you. Yeah, Hazelhurst. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of um, questions on carry forwards. First and foremost, uh, Heratonga House. And um, can you just understand on page 39, the, the budget that is going to be required for Heratonga House for us to understand um, that's where it says Heratonga House fallout. Is that, is that what we're talking about? How, do, how does. Um, initially, we had hoped to be able to carry some funds forward um, into this year to fund um, the investigative works to do with um, Hiratonga House. Yes. Um, unfortunately, given the, the rating position that we ended up with, we didn't have rates funds to carry forward for that purpose. So we've had to, we'll have to find um, funding from other, one other source to, to do that work. Right. <laughs> Very good. Um, and can you just explain to me about the EMO building? And the unspent or to be spent carry forward of 200k. What will that be used for? What's that for? Uh, my understanding that's for a uh, replacement, gener replacement generator to generator. support that building and this one as well. Great, thank you. Uh, my last one is um, while we've had unbudgeted costs for things like Kate kidnappers, um, etc., um, drag your own to track. What about the cost to Kiwi Rail's platform and station um, and the associated cost with the fire there and the cost to our ratepayers in terms of recovering those costs? Where are we at with that? Um, so Kiwi Rail have been invoiced for all of those costs. Um, there's ongoing discussions um, and there was correspondence between Mr Smith and Kiwi Rail um, as recently as this week. So we're, we're continuing those discussions with them to recover those funds. What's the sum of money? Uh, it's, it's in excess of 500,000. 608,000. So, um, when, can you please, can we ask that the Chief make an action that the Chief Executive comes back to us about that? It's been a year now um, since that fire. So, um, we need some, some clarity around that. Thank you. Councillor Barber. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just around our, our debt levels, so we're at, I would say, 115% of our income, yes. with a limit yep. going up to, what, 150? So, so yeah, yeah. Um, how are we tracking? I mean, is that, you know, we, you know and I see with some, like, 150 mil, um, I'm just, I know we've borrowed a lot, and we've, you know, big, some big projects going on, but um, how, I guess, how sustainable are those debt levels going forward? And, and are we are we looking to take on more debt in the short term? Um, so I think if you, if you refer back to um, Council's financial strategy, which is incorporated within um, our long-term plan, uh, we do acknowledge that um, debt levels were to increase um, in that long-term plan, um, and the recent work that's been going on for next year's long-term plan uh, signals that, that that will continue. Um, lots of conversation within our financial strategy that we need to ensure that our debt levels are at sustainable levels. To ensure Council has the fiscal room to respond to um, shocks uh, and events that, as they come along. Um, I think historically we've sort of envisaged that an event that would require significant borrowing of Council would be something along in terms of an earthquake. Um, you know, more recently we've had 
uh, the impacts of the, the water incident in Havelock North and, and the water change program since then. So that's, that's sort of, I guess, an indication that we had the financial capacity to um, respond to that and, and put in the necessary water infrastructure and the team are going about that as we speak. And that's, that's really what's driving um, this increase in debt level. We are still operating at levels that are um, treasury sustainable and, and within our treasury policy. So our treasury policy sits at 150%. Um, our, our funder through the LGFA has, has limits that are higher than that. Um, and I think there's a conversation at the council around what is the appropriate level um, as part of the LTP that's coming. Thank you. On pages 26 and 27, we have four recommendations. Could I have a mover and a second? To thank you, Councillor Shalom. Thank you, Councillor Barber. I'll put those recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. <coughs> And can I invite Mr Verhoeven to come forward, please? Item 7. Non-financial performance report for the year ended 30th of June 2020. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really nothing substantive for me to add to the report. Uh, the covering report um, outlines the fact that this is an interim position for the performance framework and this will ultimately find its way into your annual report, which I believe you're adopting on October the 15th. Um, this is there for your information. I guess probably the only pertinent thing to say is, and similar to the last speaker really, is that COVID's impacted on some of the non-financial performance targets, just like it's um, impacted on your financial result. Again, I've outlined that um, within the report. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? In which case, we have a recommendation on page 64. Oh, sorry. Councillor Shalom. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, uh, I'd just like to recognise the work that's in this, this reporting framework. It was a really fascinating read, um, and actually in a, in a way that was easily digestible. So thank you, um, and very happy to move to recommendations. Thank you. And a second to thank you, Councillor Sears. I'll put though that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Mr Allen, item number eight, report to Operations and Monitoring Committee on performance and monitoring. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I'll, I'll just, we've got a slight, a small presentation to take you through um, just on some of the highlights. Before we do that, maybe I'll ask the Chief Executive to make any introductory comments. Yes, please. Thank you. Through you, um, Madam Chair. Um, just, you know, I'd be really welcoming of feedback from Council. A lot of work's gone into the development of this as a comprehensive information flow that seeks to give you, as our Governors, um, good reporting against. Uh, the, 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 the priorities and all of the activities of uh, the council. Um, you know, I want to you know, acknowledge that I think we've significantly um, evolved this from um, the last report that you, um, you know, commented positively on. It's been a lot of work from um, staff, and I think for me um, personally, I will take my, my cover, of, you know, um, covering note um, as read, but. Um, you know, across all of those kind of important um, pillars um, that we've set for uh, the outcomes for our community, I think, um, and, and we'll go through a very brief presentation, um, some significant um, progress in, um, in, in every area. Um, so the presentation, so we've, we'll just cover through the, the six pillars that we have um, within the in the report, um, and we'll a bit of a tag team at the front bench here as to Who's speaking to what? Mr. Sook. Kia ora koutou, councillors. Um, so this will be a little bit of a tag team. Mr. Henson, I'll leave him to talk to his um, significant um, drinking water programme. Um, but just to re-highlight sort of a couple of key hi um, highlights working through, obviously this council working with its regional partners um, delivered the Three Waters Hawke's Bay review um, through to... Um, to the regional leaders and yourselves, but also through to central government, which puts us a step ahead off the pack in terms of the national discussion. Um, Council has signed the MOU, um, uh, um, as has every other 
local authority in the country, funnily enough, um, which releases the 15.3 million. Uh, officers are currently just finalising the delivery plan. And just to remind councillors how we were looking at putting forward that delivery plan under the chief executive, was $11 million towards our drinking water upgrade program um, into that collective works that Graham's doing, $4 million towards our backflow upgrade, um, about 60000 towards getting um, en engineering cadets and treatment plant operators, getting them employed as a career path. Um, some money towards wastewater maintenance and renewals, and we've got about 100, 150,000 set aside to do small community assessments, which we'll be talking with our regional partners around an opportunity to do that collaboratively. Um, in case the Crown Investment Partners say no, we'll also have a couple of backup projects to get them to approve, um, and that we're looking at first off the rank is um, some works out of the wastewater treatment plant to accelerate some um, work. Um, also, the ability to add to scope to our eastern intercept uh, um, rising main, which will help deal with some of our um, rain event um, wastewater overflows. So that's well in train and due to go off by the end of the month. Perhaps I've just get Mr. Henson to talk through the main water upgrades in small communities and the coastal items. Thank you, Greg, and, and uh, welcome, councillors. Um, yeah, just look a couple of minutes on the major elements of the uh, of the water program. Perhaps starting with the small community uh, water treatment upgrades. The the program remains on track as we speak. Uh, we're looking at the um, open day for Hamwana on uh, election day, which is a, a, a I suppose a momentous occasion. But uh, um, pleasing that we're talking about opening the first of uh, seven of the uh, water treatment plants and. The others uh, are in their prioritised order of delivery as we speak, with no particular uh, issues to identify. So we've got through, I suppose, the major components or the organisational related stuff that we've been working on over the last 12 to 18 months around sites and consents and approvals. Um, pleasingly, through the COVID uh, um, period, the work that was, that, that's been done in Auckland in, in a factory as an essential service has continued um, unabated, so we haven't lost time in respect of delivering the containerised treatment plants. Um, we have a little bit of pressure on us in terms of the civil works and just delivering those on a site-by-site -site basis as we as we finalise the site detail. But at this point in time, still an expectation that we will deliver and finish those by the middle of next year, which was our compliance uh, timeline. A little later than we originally indicated, but that's the timeline that the uh, Minister of Health and Drinking Water Assessors are happy with. Um, firmly, hopefully, close of business tonight. We have not had a, uh, any um, appeals to our consent position. Um, so on that basis, we are looking to physically start works next Monday. We've uh, had ourselves organised for a wee while. Um, and pleasingly, in the, in the last couple of days, we've finalised the uh, detail associated with the one submitter um, and, and the formality of the consent process. So, yeah, that, that's a significant position for Frimley, and we're, we're well positioned. We've carried on with works that you're probably frustratingly seeing as we, as we speak around the Frimley area. Um, some of that will be a challenge to manage from now through to the end of this um, calendar year. Um, but the work, once we're in the park, we will you know, domicile ourselves in a fenced-off area. There'll be interest in what we're doing, but you know, exist in our own little world for a period through to the middle of 2021. Uh, Waiaroha, uh, following the successful Open Day um, as we speak, and certainly my um, engagement with our immediate residents around the site, we're, uh, we're going well in respect of final preparation for the consent or notice of requirement elements of the projects and still looking in the, in the coming weeks to finalise that and, and lodge, I'll use the term consents, but notice of requirement processes for the uh, Waiaroha project. Perhaps just to talk to the next two, Craig, while I'm sitting here, the Waimarama seawall. Uh, pleasingly, we've just completed that work today, yesterday. Um, we've, uh, I suppose, eked out uh, a pretty substantial uh, upgrade and maintenance effort on the, uh, that perhaps Baden can comment about. But um, the, the, for the $200,000, um, we, we've done a pretty good job out there, um, both in terms of putting additional uh, rock in the wall, but also redesigning and reprofiling the thing that uh, we'll see it performing pretty well over the coming years. Uh, Cape View Corner, uh, we're meeting tonight with the uh, affected parties associated with that and we're looking to lodge consents for that uh, and some emergency works associated with Clifton within the couple, uh, coming weeks as well, in the next two weeks. 
So yeah, all that, all those projects are, are in hand and, and currently on track. So, and just the last bullet up there under the, our environment sort of highlights is obviously um, through the waste team, but importantly with a significant amount of effort from um, Naomi's marketing and comms team and the um, customer services for through Polo and Greg and their team. Um, I think now looking back, after you go through the pain of change, we've had a successful implementation of the recycling and the refuse bins um, implementation at a curbside. Um, Obviously, there was some considerable upheaval with the distraction and delays that COVID created and some long nights, but um, that's worked really well through. And just for council's interest, currently waste mins have approached council with a request to purchase the rights to our, some of our collateral material to use around the country. So that's relating to the waste booklet. Um, but also, and for those councillors who aren't aware, when we did the, the shorter leaflet guides, we have also released them in Te Reo, in Chinese, in Samoan, in Hindu, in Punjabi, as English. So we took an effort to try and be inclusive as much as we could. So, um, so we're in discussions with Wastemans and the team, and supported by our Naomi, should be um, certainly proud. Um, on the um, waste uh, going to um, the dump, on page 18, I assume it's the industrial waste that is increasing? Uh, yes, um, and, and particularly a lot of that rev increase in revenue was special waste, so that's things like asbestos, um, 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 when there's contaminated <coughs> soil, um, timber from pea houses when they're cleaned up. So a lot of the increase in revenue was actually increased in industrial, but importantly, special waste, um, which comes through. Um, oh, so, so that's a revenue figure you've got there rather than a volume right. figure. So I just need to go to that chart. What page, sorry, Councillor? Page 18, I think. Yes, that's total tonnage. Tonnage, yes, so that's a volume figure. Are there any initiatives to um, reduce industrial waste going to the landfill? Um, when you look at the household waste going down, other waste going down, um, yet we've got an increase, which I imagine is greater than expected or budgeted. Um, so my question is, are there any initiatives to reduce industrial waste going to the landfill? Uh, there are a range of initiatives in the WMNP, Waste Minimisation and Management Plan, that the Joint Councils have put together. Um, it's fair to say a lot of the initial focus was to look to move the putrescible, so the green waste, out of that urban, urban flow, because um, putrescibles are particularly problematic at the landfill and create um, and trigger off a whole pile of our emissions um, tax charges. Um, moving forward through the education and programmes, but... Um, tax changes that are coming and will directly affect us in the next LTP and as we're pulling together the budgets from 2021-22, um, it is looking likely, and we're still doing the numbers, that the gate rate at the landfill will be over 50% government taxes and levies um, compared to um, the actual cost of running the landfill. So those will create drivers and the education team led by Angela um, with Sam and Chloe will look to work with businesses around what they can do to minimise their waste on site. And there are a couple of big ones that we want to work with. And on page 30, the Karamu strategy, um, I note the, the drivers of the strategy have changed. Could you explain what the change is? worked up through the um, uh, the strategy side of the organisation, but at the uh, moment there's just negotiations going on um, uh, with the PGF funding side of the equation to uh, narrow the area of focus that will be covered off in the in the strategy. So um, but really it's... Oh, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, it's refining the catchment and the objectives of the strategy work. I think it also reflects the direction that's being set by the council around the importance of moving to more comprehensive um, 
spatial planning for, for here to Tonga and potentially regionally that um, we're, we're looking to um, re rescope what the you know, what the original um, focus of Kar Karimu was, recognising that actually we need to do this in a more comprehensive spatial planning yeah. context. Well, th thank you for that, Nigel. I was just really wanting a reassurance that um, there isn't a separate strategy going for Karimu that uh, won't be um, out, will, that will be outside of the spatial plan. Yeah, um, just, just just on the uh, Waimara Masivo, yep, cool. It's um, come up really, really good. Um, they've done a great job uh, protecting uh, you know, the houses on the front there. Um, and the, the Waimara Ma water treatment plant started work this week, so you know, the, uh, so that's good. Just in terms of the Wai Aroha, um, yeah, consultation day that we had the other the other day, Graham. Most people seem to be pretty pretty good. You know, they're just asking questions and things. But you know, there were there were some some people that were asking. Well, you know, they, they sort of seem to be hard to, to to give them questions that, well, give them answers. You know, are we? Do you think we possibly could be staring down another Frimley type of a scenario where where we, you know, where where there's going to be a bit of kickback from parts of the community? And if so. Are we are we prepared to to navigate that space? Just a feel that I got from some of the the people that were at the consultation. Hui, yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Ray, and, and uh, with, with Take us, take us into a um, into any formal hearing or consent related pro process. Now, I've met all the adjoining landowners here associated with the notification process, and I'll, I believe we're in a comfortable position with those, other than one other property that I'm working with at the moment. Um, so, our challenge over the coming weeks is to sort of finalise that and just get a strong sense. Um, certainly, out of the feedback and the forms that we collected on the day, which was more from the wider public uh, input. Uh, we're considering the messages and those, which some of them are, you know, are just simply, I don't want chlorine, and it probably almost turned into a positive saying that if education or an opportunity to actually look at new, you know, different ways and new ways forward in, in the next generation. So it's sort of support in its own way. So it's sort of saying, no, I don't like what we've got, but it's sort of almost acknowledging it, but encouraging us to, to deliver, particularly the educational and cultural elements of the project. So, yeah, no, look, I, I don't want to give it the kiss of death. Um, and, and the test will be, I've already received six of the, look, there's 30, there's 17, 18, 19 properties, there's about 35 people because we're chasing tenants and owners. Um, I've already got half a dozen, probably eight uh, of the people that have now signed up in a supportive position. The significant one was the one of this morning being that particular um, landowner that had very strong opinions, but it's, I suppose it's showing evidence of just keep... <laughs> um, battering away and see how we get on. So we've got one more other than that. The rest, I believe, are in a pretty positive space. But exactly that, though, I'd, I'd leave it with it. From there, it was only one person. So, you know, that, that will be our continuing challenge, but we'll see what occurs over this next two weeks. Graham, I'm just wondering, you also had some pretty significant notification from Nā Marae this week. Yeah, so, um, yeah, pleasingly, uh, through Hira Huata, who you've met here, and you've obviously uh, seen the significant, I suppose, both direction, guidance and manner that she brought to the table and particularly this project um, and, and as evidence on there with the uh, Karakira and Waiata and whatever that occurred opening that day and the significance of that um, is that it has followed up and I'm sure I'm reading the final document here which goes into our consent process as well that has now had um, the significant cultural um, contribution but almost uh, sign off from that uh, and it has phone call to me yesterday saying that Nā Manai or Hira Tonga uh, who are in a very or in, uh, have supported the project um, and, and through her engagement to this point, that's the position. And over the next weeks, we are looking to go to Mariah, uh, Pura, and Wananga to um, 
essentially uh, present the project beyond what's already been seemingly accepted in a cultural sense. So that, that's another significant uh, milestone or stake in the ground. If I may, I think I may have missed a question on the last item, but it does have to do with water. Um, I noticed that there was a 21% water loss in the network. Um, now, that's really quite significant when we're talking about uh, water conservation, capping uh, water for horticulture, um, capping water for industry. Um, and I'm just wondering what we're doing to address that and how quickly we're doing it. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, so a key part of the actual um, delivery of the capital water strategy that Mr Henson is delivering um, in connection with the booster pump station in Havelock North, a, a key mitigation will be when that's all in place, we will be reducing the pressures across Hastings City um, and a reduction of um, pressures, we'll see a reduction of uh, water loss um, and then the renewal program, which you would have seen in the LTP, will see an increased renewal, particularly of connections, um, which are coming to the end of their natural life. Um, so that reduces some of those leaks, um, but also building in towards around um, additional monitoring, targeting um, of, of works. Um, and also because we don't... Um, we don't monitor every every stage of the way. So for example, as part of um, water that may not get to a house is we have to flush the water mains um, to keep the water fresh, particularly in dead end roads. And we're not currently monitoring how much of that so we're making an assumption. So our new maintenance contract, which we're um, out to market at the moment, is looking for more detail and information. And so the more data, the more information, the more targeted we can get. But the key change is going to be um, that upping of renewals as we head into that cycle and ch lowering the pressures. Because if you push the system um, less hard, you don't push the water out as much. As part of the tank plan change, um, which is obviously going through its process, um, both ourselves and Napier have committed to, to get to a more efficient level. Um, and it's a staged approach as we work, work our way through. So absolutely, we've got some work to do to improve that efficiency rating. If it's 21% now, what would be an acceptable target to aim for? <laughs> oh, through you, Madam Chair, I'd have to come back, talk to the team what the target is that's been set and working through with the investment that's put in front of you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just following up on Baden's question and uh, Graham's response, um, I, can I just, yes, on Saturday, um, that was an incredibly worthwhile process and, um, and thank you to the councillors that stayed a lot of the time because it was all hands to the pump actually. Uh, everybody wanted one on one. They wanted to be able to have the, everything explained to them from technical uh, questions around resilience to how how the um, telling our story and why Araha would would look and and input into you know what the whole layout and the landscape looks like and that you know for a twenty million dollar project it's 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 absolutely crucial that we're able to give people that one on one that they can fully uh, understand that we have had all the design peer reviewed by engineers, uh, that, that they are going to be able to walk amongst a lovely area and trees and, and, um, and be able to learn the story. It was incredibly positive. And while and the questions that um, were raised, that um, people just actually weren't uh, fully understanding of you know, how the whole thing technically was going to work. And so I think that you know, I, I'm quite happy that we, we do another one of those. Um, and, and just because there were so many people in a short time of four hours to get through to get their questions answered. I mean, we had, um, we had principals from school, we had all sorts of community that were there that were, took a real interest in this, because this is their project. Um, as I said, it's not a council project, we are delivering it for the community, it's about our future for safe drinking water. And, and so I, I just think that the more that we can do of just um, that one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's an incredible project. And I think that um, 
that, you know, and it was hard for us to manage all the people at the same time coming and wanting the answers to these very, very important questions. And once you were able to give them some time and, and explain it and show them the booklet and, and all the imagery, and the, the team who were there were exceptional. Uh, we're blessed to have some mighty, mighty people that um, could explain to the community how this will work. So, um, so don't, don't be shy. You know, we'll keep doing this because we want to make sure everybody fully understands how this is going to work. This is different. This is new. It's a big investment, and we need to make sure that everybody is, is part of that journey. So I'm not, I'm not in fear. I'm, in, I'm proud of where we've got to, um, and, and, but it's making sure that people have the answers that they need instead of having to write to the newspaper and ask the questions there. You know, let's have another session and, and do that one-on-one -on -one again. Um, so just through you, Madam Chair, just very briefly on moving around. So speed limit console um, submission process has closed. Um, so we have in the order of just over 2,000 submissions received. And I understand currently at this point in time, although sometimes people pull out, there are around 100 people who would like to speak. Um, so we're due to come back to you on the 12th of November where those submissions to council will begin to be heard. Um, and just probably a key other one, which has been a really exciting project, is Jobs for Heratonga. Now with that, all that work with the government 19, 9. Um, 19, if only, um, $9.3 million, um, that work is well in train. There are footpaths going in all over the city. Uh, many of you would have seen down Karamu Road, where Top Line have been busy, um, Tamoana, Tamoana Road, very um, lots of work going on there. There have been some sites that we've had to swap out from the original list. Um, we've taken an approach, um, particularly they've been Havelock North sites where landowners have decided they do not want that footpath or they wanted longer to talk about it. Um, we didn't have time to talk, so we've just swapped them out. Um, and largely they've gone either um, the, to date largely into Flaxmere around Kimiora, um, and there's some other options that we're working through. So we're just taking a very agile, um, fast approach to keep moving. Um, the substantive works at Waipatu Settlement are due to start shortly. Um, we do, we're just working through with one of the property owners just to work through their concerns before we break earth um, in there just to make sure that that's been resolved um, fully. Um, so I shall ask Mr Cameron if he can uh, contribute to the slide. Thanks. It's called a hospital pass. Uh, thanks for the uh, warning, colleague. Um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, probably the key sort of takeout from our discussions this morning, and uh, you'll see it in the narrative and the uh, report, um, uh, we are in obviously re recessionary times and extraordinary times, but a lot of the data sets are, are presenting a, a different sort of perspective, whether it's the retail stats and the economy or unemployment levels being below what was anticipated and um, uh, uh, our consenting loads are uh, at historic highs going through council. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, I think what it sort of says is that it's difficult to forecast uh, where we're going to be. Uh, but the pleasing situation we do seem to be in at the moment that we are in a better position than what was forecasted that we would be in. So... Um, uh, that's really what's going on in our, our economic uh, front at the moment, and we've brought quite a number of sort of economic projects and opportunities, which, um, uh, because of the business information involved, uh, can't be made public at this time. But suffice to say that um, I think we have got difficult and challenging times going ahead. Council does need to be an innovative and responsive uh, organisation, delivering good quality local government services for our uh, community. But the the I guess the green shoots in the situation are is that um, uh, I think that we can look on this more as a glass half full situation than necessarily a glass half empty and apply those innovations um, to keep delivering or help facilitating those good outcomes for the economy. And I think you'll see, uh, if you look into the report and read the commentary around the um, different sectors, whether it's retail or horticulture um, or uh, pastoral or whatever, um, those kind of themes are generally uh, reflected across the major sectors. Yeah. 
not this one I am interviewing. So um, I think, okay, so for housing, again, the key takeout is that um, the consent lows both uh, resource and um, building consents are well up, and you'll see the graphs uh, in your detailed report uh, showing that, um, again, which is pleasing. Um, pleasing to the point where council is uh, having to um, outsource work and bring in additional resources to make sure we keep processing in a, in a timely and quality manner. Um, we traversed uh, pretty thoroughly in the strategy and policy meetings um, last week uh, what's happening on the housing front. So I think the, um, the most probably important outcomes for uh, the community which we traversed is our agreement that council's entered into with uh, Crown Infrastructure co-funding model where council funding will um, uh, fund the delivery of the community infrastructure into the Iona zone and Havelock North to unlock um, that Greenfields housing opportunity and the government uh, funding the internal servicing of, of council lands uh, with Tarbot already underway and uh, council will be uh, exploring both strategically and from a policy point of view as we discussed last week the opportunity to develop circa those 180 sections on council-owned land, which um, with the government assistance can enable us to uh, deliver on those social and emergency and affordable housing income. So um, yes, we face fairly drastic times, as we uh, know in Hastings, and you'll see it covered in the more detailed information in your report, in terms of the different sectors of our community that need um, uh, accommodation. Um, but these initiatives really help council to facilitate those step change, sort of um, steps forward in addressing these challenges. So it's a space, again, we have to be nimble and fast and proactive in, um, but there's some really good tangible steps that, that we're taking. So, yeah. And just, just uh, on Tarver Street, just for completeness, <coughs> we um, executed the funding agreement with the Provincial Growth Fund for the $2 million for um, Tarver Street. Um, this week, so um, four hundred thousand is payable on the, the, the signing of the contract, and obviously we're um, you know making rapid um, rapid progress, um, but uh, and on track to um, have the um, earthworks completed by um, the the end of the year, and um, and, and into house building, um, yeah, in, in twenty twenty one, which will be great. Ask a question. Thank you. Oh, sorry, is there more to go? Yeah. I'll wait. So through you, Madam Chair, just are you on the next slide? Yeah. Just very quickly in the in the open space park spaces, the Karanga Reserve Management Plan is well in train with that consultation process um, progressing well. Councillors will be aware of the trial that's been going on in the um, AMP showgrounds. Um, just probably to add, you, you may or may not be aware, um, Napier City have followed suit in the waiving of sports ground fees in similar vein to Hastings. Um, and just to, for council's assurance, officers are following up um, just to make sure the sports associations are passing on that fee waiver to sports clubs and their users. Um, there's a, just a bit of feedback from one or two of them that we're just following up just to make sure that our users are getting the feedback rather than the sports associations themselves. Um, and just covering off, um, as you know, Toy Toy is one of our facilities probably impacted the most um, by, by COVID. So you know, the, the, the opening was on the 29th of February and they were closed down by the 21st, I think it was, of March. Um, and it's been a bit of a checkered um, time since then, since reopening at level one. They had some events in July and then we went back into level two um, for the last um, few weeks. So yeah, they've, had, they've got really strong demand and strong bookings. Um, most, almost all shows that have had to be, that have, were through this sort of level two time more recently, um, they're not cancelling, they're postponing. Um, they want the shows to go ahead uh, and the team are working with them to try and um, you know, find dates. What that's doing, though, is um, creating quite a congested time between now and Christmas and into the new year. It shows um, trying to find new dates to be performed um, at, at Toy Toy. Um, so the, they have been working um, you know, with promoters and the like to see if, if shows can go ahead at reduced numbers. Um, hopefully next week that won't be required. 
Um, but for a lot of promoters, um, having having sort of limitations to 100 or 200, if we if we sort of could open up the stalls and the dress circle, for example, um, separately, um, st still not numbers that for a lot of promoters are, are creates a viable uh, proposition for that event. So the the preference for being for promoters and for the shows themselves is to sort of push forward and, and, and try and set a new date uh, for them to take place. Um, Splash Planet had another good year um, last year, so reflecting this report is up to the 30th of June and, and sort of captures the end of, of that season, so you know, 116,000 people through the gates, 55% um, of which were visitors with non -club, that were non-club card members, so that reflects people that generally had to, tra to travel some distance to get there. Um, and our aquatics facilities were, were again another facil facilities that were quite impacted by um, COVID and the lockdown. And um, as Mr. Wilson talked about earlier, uh, with our decline in fees and charges, you know, these our, our indoor um, aquatics facilities, particularly with Learn to Swim, uh, were quite significantly impacted. Uh, and their revenues um, um, took, took a bit of a hit. So. Um, Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, I just would like to just pick up on Splash Planet and um, <coughs> given its popularity and its and us managing its future, and as we've been discussing it a lot this week in terms of managing through COVID restrictions, can you give us a time frame on when we will be looking at uh, what it's what it's, not just its maintenance, but its improvements will also include uh, coming up. And and I think that, you know, we, when we discussed closing it this year, if we couldn't open it through COVID, and we talked about could we add any value, we actually need to have a plan so we know where its future lies and what, what it is going to look like. When will that work be undertaken um, to look at Splash and to look at, is it, is it a reserve management plan? Is it... Is it a separate entity on its own? Um, is it as part of the Windsor Park wider picture? Uh, I, th I just think that, you know, we're, so far from the profit, we've we've gathered up $600,000. Um, I, I think over three years, Bruce, is that correct? $600,000? Yeah, it does have a reserve uh, it's for reserved. Uh, improvements and um, yeah. maintenance and renewals of that sort of value. So, so just in terms of us understanding the, the improvements and the maintenance and the investment, um, you know, can, can we have an idea of what, what that looks like? Yes, we'll be bringing that back to Council in the coming months. It's uh, probably in a couple of phases. There's the, um, basically the plan for um, how we um, uh, improve or address, um, uh, I guess, the assets that exist there um, now. The, the second piece of work that's um, much bigger and we need to bring the scope back is more... Um, I guess the, the biggest strategic um, review of um, Splash Planner in the context of the overall sort of Windsor Park um, sort of precinct and aquatic review, um, you know, in the context of an, you know, an Olympic swimming pool being added to the aquatics um, and, and how we think about more, more broadly um, the, the full aquatics offering. So um, it will be in a couple of bites, but we'll, 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 be, um, we'll be coming back um, shortly on the... Um, yeah, on, on the on the on the plan for the first one and the scope um, of the the bigger strategic review. Thank you. The comments haven't changed that much from what I was planning to say. There's lots of exciting things happening. You know, big list of things, and you sort of get a bit overwhelmed by it all. The the two I really liked was the comments on Splash Planet which actually give us some numbers. It'd just be handy if we had something to compare it with, like last year or the average over the recent years. I think that would be a good good figure to have. And the other one was Tower Street, where, where you actually have told us you know, how many sections what they're going to be used for. And I think when reports, if they, for me, if they could contain that sort of information, I would feel very much better informed than they are. Otherwise, it seems to come up meeting after meeting, but you can't actually work out what's happened in between and I don't know if you can do it, but it would be really useful. Yeah, page 49 actually has a graph showing you exactly what you need to know, by the way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
However, your comment did remind me that this, this report is a work in progress and um, we are heading towards perfection and we're heading <coughs> towards uh, a document that actually tells you everything that you need to know and it would be helpful if you kind of kept this at your elbow because hopefully the goal will be when you are asked questions by constituents, when's this happening, why did that happen, is this working, then, th then this document is the one go-to document that will contain everything you need to know. And a particular bugbear of mine is addressed on page 77, and I'm really keen for our newest councillors um, to actually uh, work with me on that one. It's a glossary of acronyms and terms. Now, when I was first elected, I was discombobulated by the number of acronyms uh, that local government contains. And so if you come across things that you think, what on earth is that? If you can feed those through and we will add it into a master list so that when you're reading the document, you can just flick through, oh, that's what that is. And I think um, not just for you, because actually if you've come across that term, it means you've already sort of grappled with it. But for the people who come after, that's going to be a really useful thing for any newly elected councillor. That's going to be a, a really reference. Yeah. Moving on to Denise. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is the last slide, but fine. What was the most important? Oh, thanks, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Save the best to us. I uh, thank you through you, Madam Chair. So, uh, yes, we've got our $985,000 and we've started uh, working <coughs> on um, recruitment. So that's well underway. We had one new staff member start on Monday. Uh, and he's very excited. I met with him today. We've got the other youth connector, the employer connector, and the Henning Arto connector. That's well underway. So hopefully by October we'll have a full team ready to go. Um, our caravan. We hope to be mobilised by middle to late October. So we've we've got we've hopefully found one. We've just got to get it done up so we can get out there. Uh, what else have we got going? The grants. Um, so. We only have a fund of $245,000 and we're oversubscribed by $417,000 and 30 of 57 applicants receive funding from us. So obviously you can see uh, the gap there and those of you that sit on the committee know that. Community plans, so Tipu Hui, we have another Hui tonight um, and Rodeka and Camberley. Hopefully October, November will be coming to council or you'll be coming to the community to endorse their plans. And then the wealthy response through COVID and the network of networks, uh, a couple of us were actually leads within that network, and that works really effectively more around building those relationships, which we've managed to continue. A couple of the groups are still going, so the older persons group is still going, the homeless group is still going, and also the RSC group is still going as well. Any questions? Sorry to be keeping yeah, asking questions. Yeah. I'm just interested in about the network of networks, Denise, and mm. those groups still going. Mm -hmm. Who are leading those groups, particularly the um, older persons and the net and the homeless people? Thank you, through you, the Chair. So for homeless, that's through Housing First. So the people that were still uh, working with uh, through COVID, there was a number of us, but Housing First are leading that network now. So we will start to meet again uh, in the next week or so. Uh, and then what was your other question? The seniors, so that's being led actually still through CEDM at the moment. Yeah. What are the main services that people are requiring, please? Through you, um, Madam Chair, uh, probably more around for the, for the elderly, be around social isolation at this stage. So that's what's coming through through <coughs> there. Okay. And with the homeless, we're, we're still working through. So, housing first, when we went into COVID, they'd only just started. So it actually was housing first on steroids, basically. So we're just working through what that looks like and means for them now. Uh, so kind of in a hold, not in a holding pattern, but we're in a, in a place to see where they, sh where they need to be moving to and what that looks like. So we've got accommodation for our homeless until December, is that correct? Correct. And so we haven't got any plans post-December? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, that's what we'll be discussing at the next uh, upcoming meetings we've got. So, so they've been supported through government at this stage, yes. and then we need to put a plan in place after that. Not yeah. too far away. No. No. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Now, we have a recommendation on page 66 to receive the report. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Shollum. Thank you, Councillor Lawson. I'm going to put that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. 
Contrary, carried. It's now three o'clock and the scheduled time for afternoon tea. <laughs>
Welcome back, um, and we will recommence at agenda item nine, which is the Hastings COVID-19 recovery plan update, and I'm going to hand over to Mr. Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll, generate, I'll take the report as read. It's, it's in response to um, the recovery plan that Council adopted back in May. Uh, it's the second time now that we've reported against uh, actions um, within that plan. Um, attached to this report is, is a, a couple of um, summaries of, of the economic actions and the, and the community actions that we've identified uh, within that plan and what's been done to date. There are uh, um, two, two items of interest um, within the report. Um, one's a, a, a request or a recommendation for the, uh, to trial um, what we've referred to as the Hawke's Bay Business Hub Hastings uh, and a request for funding uh, to support that uh, for the balance of this financial year through to June uh, as a trial or a pilot um, and for that to be uh, brought back to Council again uh, in March uh, to, to determine whether it's been successful or not and whether Council would uh, entertain, including in its long-term plan funding uh, for that project to continue on. <coughs> Just noting that in Recommendation B, uh, it refers to an allocation of $90,000 from Council's COVID-19 Recovery Contingency Fund uh, that should read 70,000, uh, 20,000, um, if that is approved, will come from uh, the existing economic development budgets. Um, the second component uh, to this report is uh, some discussion on the balance of the COVID-19 recovery contingency fund. Uh, should you determine that the funding should be allocated to the Hooks Bay Business Hub Hastings project, that would leave about, or leave $430,000 up in that contingency fund for Council to determine its use. And, and really all we're signalling at this stage is um, that that is there, um, that, that also that there's a lot of you know, uncertainty going forward as to what, what the future looks like and how um, Hastings, <coughs> its economy and its community are going to recover uh, from, from COVID-19 and the impacts of... Um, not only the lockdown that we experienced through um, April and May, but also you know, the impacts of being at level two now, um, the impacts of Auckland at being you know, at lockdown levels um, higher than that and how that flows through the country and the impacts, but also the global impacts as well. A lot of what happens in Hastings um, gets exported as, as well. So uh, really just signalling that that fund is there um, and that uh, we recommend to Council that offices will go away and and work up um, a more a strategic plan on how that can be best utilised around its, its use, its purpose and its timing, acknowledging we don't necessarily know how this is all going to play out um, and actually keeping, keeping some funding aside uh, to respond to um, opportunities or, or activities that may occur in the future uh, might be worthwhile. So happy to take questions. Thank you, Councillor Shobham. Um, thank you. If I might first of all acknowledge the work that's been done to date on the COVID recovery plan, um, both economic and community actions. Um, thank you uh, to the staff and also the councillors who have been involved in that. Um, it's been really great to see Hastings District Council take a proactive approach to um, help our community as a whole recover from COVID-19. Um, Moving on to uh, 4.0, which is the discussion around the Hawke's Bay Business Hub Hastings um, proposal. Uh, my initial question is around the intent of this proposal. So I read in 4.2 um, that this is a response to a request from Council um, to investigate options for enhanced delivery of business support services to Hastings businesses and more specifically to work in partnership with stakeholders to develop and implement a business hub in Hastings to support business recovery at alert level two. Can you please remind me roughly the time frame at which that mandate was put out from council? Was this during lockdown? I can't recall. Through Madam Chair, I <coughs> can't recall the dates, but yes, it was actually during the lockdown period where we were working under the incident management structure at Council. So it's probably back in April or May somewhere. Um, and uh, the Council at the time just requested uh, that officers put together a draft uh, recovery 
uh, strategy. In the normal context of civil defence management, recovery is part of the civil defence national emergency structure, but our council just decided it wanted to get its own house in order and understand how as an organisation we could then constructively participate in the, any regional responses. And um, uh, we looked at the community social side of the um, uh, community and, the, of course, the economic side of the community. And uh, one of the uh, lines in the, um, in the strategy that was adopted by council was to explore, or for officers to explore the opportunity for situ situating a hub type uh, situation where businesses could um, access, particularly the government agencies that may be able to line them up to the you know, support options uh, from government. And it was felt at the time um, that situating that actually in Hastings and making it accessible uh, could prove to be a useful uh, add value tool. So that's been the impetus um, for the officers exploring and developing uh, the opportunity. And associated with that is the management lens that um, we feel uh, we investigated the situation, answered that council direction to um, put some structure around the opportunity. And accordingly, we're recommending that we take a, should council wish to adopt it, uh, we take a pilot approach. We would have flexibility in the lease situation and we can develop that understanding of whether it is actually a, a useful investment and um, and then, of course, tailor how the model actually continues to work and deliver uh, based on the information that we learn between now and March. And, of course, one of your learnings may well be that um, it serves no useful purpose after the end of March or you may continue to invest in it and evolve. Thank you. Follow-up question, if I might. Um, how does the proposed business hub differ, if, if at all, in any way from the offering that is in Ahu Valley at the moment? Uh, I don't think it's, it's so much a point of difference. Um, uh, I guess uh, colloquially in Hawke's Bay there is a perception that 12 miles distance from Hastings to Napier is rather an insurmountable uh, uh, barrier for segments of the um, economy. Um, uh, I don't subscribe to that myself, but I have heard that it is somewhat prevalent in Hawke's Bay. So, um, it was felt too that I think if we situated it in the commerce centre of Hastings and... Um, a part of it is, is situating it, and the other part is communicating the offer. So along with council investment and your pilot project, it needs 9,000 odd, I think, businesses in, uh, in Hastings. Um, uh, some substantial percentage, so I think circa 80%, employ 10 or less people. So as well as uh, uh, aggregating and situating that small sport of offerings from mainly the government agencies and the, uh, the business support agencies, there will have to be an extensive engagement program through various channels to make the businesses you know, aware of those uh, opportunities. But even if you look at the regional um, uh, business partner type program, that's co-funding for investment into services for business. So and I understand the take-up of those um, uh, tools that are available at the moment are quite substantial. The government has substantially increased the level of investment into those tools. So I think if... My initial view, having looked at the officers' work, is, is if we, if the council does decide to set up the hub and we do invest well in that communications and engagement strategy, I'll be very surprised if there's not a good sort of strong uptake um, over the next six months, particularly given these uncertain times. Um, looking with it through you, Madam Chair, um, looking at 4.7, um, it's noted that businesses seeking support are likely to be those with less than 10 employees. 9,027 Hastings businesses have less than 10 employees. And I believe in the um, information we were given in our workshop earlier today, we've got roughly 9,900 and something businesses overall. So, um, so a good portion uh, in that SME category. Um, what, what plans do you have in place or if, if we were to approve this funding, to engage those small businesses, the, the ones that are probably arguably less likely to understand what they need support and, and the fact that there's any support out there. I can't speak for the detail work the officers have done, but I think just through our, your normal membership registers and, and um, our own databases like the Great Things Grow here and so forth, there's, there's pretty... Um, there'll be direct sort of access to sort of several thousand of those types of businesses straight up. 
and then um, uh, simply we'll have to be smart as to how we engage and and um, and and make that offering available. I think if you look around to definitions of success, um, uh, in, in my view, if, if some actions out of this project help even five or six businesses take on one or two staff or sustain one job, you would only need to have six pretty minor micro outcomes like that. And in terms of the economic benefit, you've paid for council's investment seven times over. So. Uh, for me, good quality um, uh, social economic investment, or, um, and the rule of thumb that I've, if council uh, invests staff time um, into enabling things for social outcomes, I always like to see just as a manager a general at least ten to fifteen dollar return for each direct dollar of council investment in terms of economic benefit for the uh, or social benefit for the community, whether that's growth or savings. I think that's a f that's a, a fair return on the ratepayer um, investment. So for here, um, and you can measure those engagements. So if the officers review with whatever businesses, whether they take what kind of support they take out, whether it's HR advice or marketing or whatever, um, if there's a some sort of link to a, um, an employment sustainability outcome, an additional employment outcome, a capital kit investment or whatever, you only need those five or six actions to get that. You know, that wider uh, benefit return. Um, my other question is around um, engagement with the current services offered. Because it sounds like this proposal is essentially creating a Hastings version of um, the current Hawke's Bay Business Hub, um, which I do see some merit in. Um, as I understand it, the only measure we have is currently through uptake of the regional um, business partners program. Is that correct? You mean in respect of the utilisation of the business hub? Or? Yes. <coughs> uh, for, <coughs> for this exercise, they've just gone to the, um, the the business partnership program for the outcomes and the engagement. There are other measures for utilisation of the business hub, such as visitation and um, uh, what engagements have, uh, you know, the outcomes that they've led to. That's part of the KPIs and the funding for the agency. Um, I can get that kind of information uh, for you, but I think they've, the officers, for the sake of this report, have focused more on that regional assistance program. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I, I recognise that um, process different, differs in the meetings under different chairs. Um, I have a recommendation that I would like to move, but I respect that you have called for questions. Um, if I may ask uh, Ms Evans, um, if I do have a recommendation that I wish to move, but would like to allow others to ask questions, can it still come back to me to move those recommendations or do I need to move them now? Uh, you can uh, move the noted motion. So, uh, and, and All right. <coughs> um, if I might, Madam Chair. Um, may I make a comment before I do so? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I will respect that. I have held the floor. Um, what I recognise in this report is that our um, officers have done... Um, an absolutely fantastic job at following our direction, which is this council gave quite a specific order to um, investigate a Hastings Hawke's Bay business hub. When actually I think our overarching intent, specifically because we're in lockdown at the time, was actually to find out how to better connect our business community with support services that are available. The reason why I think the conclusion was reached that we needed a Hastings um, Hawke's Bay Business Hub was because uh, we assumed that a barrier to access accessing those services was the location of them, which is currently housed in Ahuriri. The problem that I currently have is that um, I don't have evidence either way as to whether or not that's true or not. And I am conscious that whether it's ninety or $70,000 being taken from our COVID recovery fund is a significant amount of money in which to pilot something to test an assumption. Um, when there are possibly other ways that that assumption could be tested, perhaps in the form of um, employing a um, business connector that sits within Hastings, but co-locating them somewhere so that we don't have lease expenses, um, considering how we can better refer or potentially even looking at 
investing some money and better promoting the services that currently exist in the business hub in Ahurere so that Hastings businesses are aware of them and can access those. Um, it's for that reason that while I absolutely support the principle behind this, and I believe we need to be proactively supporting our business community, I don't believe that this in its current form is the correct way forward. So I would like to move um, or, or make a notice of motion for amended recommendations. Um, my amend amendment would be to B, and I would like to change that to that officers report back to council with detail on barriers and challenges that prevent Hastings businesses from util utilising the business support services currently located in the Hawke's Bay Business Hub and proposed plans to mitigate these barriers. What I believe this recommendation will allow us to do and allow our officers to do is more broadly look at the problem, understanding that the desired objective here is to more easily and better connect our Hastings business community to those support services in whatever way is the most cost effective and impactful way, whether that means a Hastings business hub or it may mean something else. I believe that the initial direction we issued was too specific and our staff have absolutely done what we asked of them, but in hindsight, I think that was an error. Um, thank you. What I would like to do now is to hear from the other speakers before we return to your, your proposed motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Watkins. All right, th thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I, I support this initiative. It's a pilot. I think it will have far-reaching benefits for the Hastings business community. We had a very useful workshop this morning um, where a lot of questions were asked. We got some answers. We know some answers are coming back, and I'm very satisfied with that, and I'm happy to move the recommendations. Thank you. Um, Well, I'd actually like to hear from the other speakers first. So I'm not going to um, accept your moving the recommendations just until I've heard from the other speakers. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Hazelhurst. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I also support this initiative. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity for our Hastings small business community, close to 10,000 businesses, to have direct access to some of the government agencies like NZTE, like Calhoun Innovation, like business support, uh, we have a, 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 an opportunity to have our own Hastings Business Hub in our CBD. When I look at uh, seeing some of the, um, and I hear the challenges of some of our business community who are suffering post-COVID, this is like a, an opportunity, just as we've done our Youth Employment Hub, actually, for me, it's having a shop frontage for people to go in and seek advice. And when I look at the difference between having our youth employment connectors sitting in an office in council and having them downtown where young people can access front of front a shop window and actually get some support, <laughs> the difference in the numbers that we've seen between working over here and working there, this is no different for me. This is an opportunity for people to reach out and get some really good professional advice. Um, this is the best COVID recovery we could have. We have 31% increase in job seeker benefits in Hastings. That's the highest in Hawke's Bay. And I can't. And who employs the people? It is our Hastings <coughs> businesses. I can't sit here and not look at a way in which we can find to support those our business community so they can carry on with their businesses, so they can be successful and prosperous, so they can employ our young people and our older people. And we have an opportunity to do this for a very small amount of money. This is the best COVID recovery uh, investment we could do, and that is the people who employ our business. Yes, it's a pilot. Yes, there will be a framework. All of that will come, but we've got to put a stake in the ground and say that this is what we have to do for our community. Hilda? Thank you. Councillor Dixon? Yeah, thank you, Worship. I'm also very, very supportive of the recommendations as written. The reason behind this, this is money to trial from the COVID contingency fund. It's going to be well spent because it's aimed at supporting our business community. And that's what it's there for. It will let, give us information, which will mean we can run it internally in six months' time when we, after a review, or effectively bring it back to the headquarters of business Hawke's Bay to Hastings, because we are, after all, the powerhouse of economic development. So it's an ideal time to trial it, 
and the COVID fund is the ideal way to do it because it's supporting local business. Thank you. Councillor Nixon. Thank you. Um, I don't have the same enthusiasm for the proposal as some councillors. I'm more <coughs> in Councillor Shollin's corner on this one. We're going to spend, in the first instance, uh, $70,000 on this proposal. If it goes for another year, it'll build up to nearly $200,000. It's not an insignificant amount of money. And I think we need to remember the fact that we have put the funds aside as part of the contingency fund does not mean to say we have to look for ways to spend it or spend it full stop if the evidence does not support what we are doing. To me, we're actually trying to spend more money to make Business Hawke's Bay more effective, and we are already contributing significantly to that organisation. I wonder, we talk about all these uh, businesses. I saw some figures recently. Uh, the vast majority of our businesses are one-man businesses. I'm probably one of them, actually. Um, and I wonder, do we know who these businesses are? Have we got a better way of of tapping into them, <coughs> talking to them, finding out what they need, finding out if they even need this service. Because if they're not going over to Ahariri at the moment, and it's not that far to go, uh, it shows some weakness in our current way that we um, are trying to assist and promote businesses. Uh, and I just feel any, any business that I've been involved with goes looking for its customers uh, and I just wonder if Business Hawks Bay actually do that particularly effectively. So I'm really, uh, and I seconded uh, Councillor Shollin's proposal because I'm not yet convinced that this is the right way to go. It might be. I might change my mind if I was given more information, but I actually don't think I've got enough information to be supportive at this point. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you. I think I may take um, a little, little bit of the responsibility for this because I do recall uh, raising this as I was sitting at home in lockdown level four um, and saying that we needed to look at having um, business support agencies here in Hastings. Um, but it wasn't... I probably saw that the, op the opportunity was COVID um, and to wrap it around COVID was a good way to actually achieve it. Um, so I am supportive of us establishing. But what I'm concerned about is that if we look at the uh, COVID recovery fund and the applications that we have, have had put in place, um, they all were really compelling and convincing because of the actions and stuff that they were proposing. And so, you know, they all had... The business associations had a range of marketing activities that they were putting forward. Um, this, this one has come more so from our offices, not necessarily business hawk space, so we're still a little bit grey to what they are actually going to offer. Um, and so uh, that, that's, that, to me, that's the missing part. So I'll, I'm happy to support it but it is with the proviso that we really do understand what are going to be the actions going forward, and I would like to see, you know, what type of working party with governance involvement that we actually do have to wrap around that, um, because I don't want it to be here for four, five, six months. It's something that has to be re-established and returned back to where it should be. Um, so that's where I would like to see that focus going. I don't want this to be seen as tokenism. I don't want... Uh, there's a little bit of cynicism with me in regards to this. Will those come? Those that uh, we're hoping come over, do they come over, but really they think that the sun shines nicer, a little bit more nice on the other side by the water, and therefore they return after six months. So if we're going to do it, we need to do it as best as we possibly can. Um, I, I also um, support the recommendation. I think uh, now is the time to trial an initiative like this, and it is um, recommended or proposed that it is a trial. Um, and I think it is appropriate use of the 
fund that we set aside for COVID recovery. Um, I pick up on Damien's, da Damien's comment. Um, I, I would like to know uh, what the plan is, but also um, how we're going to measure whether it's been successful or not. I wouldn't want to go wandering into it and wandering out of it um, without some good plan. So where's, where's, the, where's the hub going to be? Mm -hmm. Where's it located? The Tribune. Yeah. Does it, but does it meet the, the cool factor? Because <laughs> these, these business hubs, they, they, they actually, they actually... That's why it's going where it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Cool price. That's good. Because, mm, mm. yeah. I mean, it, that, that's important. I mean, we want people to use it. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. Um, the one over in Ahuriri, you know, nice, nice location. Um, you know, kind of a trendy part of, of Napier. And, um, and 90000 even though it's a trial, still $90,000. So um, just want to see that it's, it's well spent and, and just well marketed and, and well supported. So, 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 sorry, just just to confirm that one hundred percent. It's it's seventy thousand required to, out of the contingency fund. Twenty thousand will come from the economic development budget. It's ninety thousand in total. Yeah. Where we are now, we have the um, contrary recommendation from Councillor Shollam. Do we have that in writing? So I propose uh, putting that motion first. We had uh, a mover from Councillor Shollam and a seconder from Councillor Nixon. Yeah. So if you'd just like to read that through. Councillor's report, uh, officers report back to Council with detail on barriers and challenges that prevent Hastings-based businesses from utilising the business support services currently located in the Hawke's Bay Business Hub. Full stop. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, and proposed plans to mitigate these barriers. Okay, so I'm going to put that motion. Um, Madam Chair, may I have a right of reply? Um, yes, although I will I'm conscious that you have actually had rather a lot to say about this. So can you can you be succinct? I will be succinct. Yeah. Um, just because we build it does not mean they will come. That is my key concern. And whilst I support the intent behind the initial recommendations, <coughs> I do not believe that we have enough information yet or have researched enough alternatives to challenge to make sure that uh, simply replicating the Hawke's Bay Business Hub in a Hastings location is the right way to spend ratepayers' money and specifically the COVID recovery fund. Thank you. I'm now going to put that motion. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Uh, uh, the, the recommendation was lost uh, and now I'll revert to the original recommendations, the original A, the original B and the original C. All those in favour, oh, please. Oh, one moment. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Thank so, you. So just, be, just before, I'm happy to second it, Madam yes. Chair, but I just wonder if the mover of the recommendation would pick up Councillor Harvey's point about uh, having a, a governance overview as part of B um, to, to work through what this will look like in terms of the outcomes for the Hastings business community. So we just need to add that in as part of B that there will be... Can you work on some wording there? This is Ms Evans? Put it at the end of B after the about the long term plan deliberations.
happy with that wording, Mayor Hazlehurst? Mr Watkins, uh, Councillor Watkins? So we have a go at working on this. Yeah. So if we just work on uh, the, the recommendation, but if the intent is that this is subject to agreeing and bringing back to council the agreed, um, you know, uh, sort of approach and KPIs at the front end, so council. Yeah, so it's not um, reporting, yeah. But yeah, it's about agreeing the about approach the and the KPIs. Yeah. This is the process. Yes. Process. Right, Councillor Watkins, are you happy with that? It seems to accord with the intent that you expressed. Yep. Thank you. I'm now going to put those uh, four motions, please. We had a, a mover and a seconder. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you want your? Do you want your? Yeah. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now moving along to our next item, and I just want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that um, if you were looking originally on the hub, that uh, last night you received uh, an update to that paper, including. Um, uh, through our pre-agenda, uh, we actually renamed that report. It is now entitled the Tree Management Programme. 
Um, and I'm going to invite Mr. Lee Slip to speak to it. Thank you. Um, through you, Madam Chair. You. Um, just a um, quick scene setter. I'm conscious you um, have had a big um, agenda so far. Um, so this paper simply looks to respond to multiple community requests to remove a number of what is deemed nuisance trees. Um, many of you would have seen some of these requests um, over the last few months that have been coming through. Um, seeing Councillor Dixon smiling, I think he's seen a few that he's, he's aware of. Um, I think it's also important to remember that this, this work is proposed over a 10-year period subject to available funding, so this isn't about... Uh, going in and resolving all of these issues straight away. Um, important to note is to manage the requests for the renewal of any of Council's 25,000 tr plus trees, officers are required to follow a tree removal policy. Um, under the current policy, the list that you see there does not fit. Um, and, and what this paper is also asking you to do to be more efficient and more responsive to community requests and for these reasonable requests is a minor amendment to that current tree policy which will enable trees to be removed if they're creating a nuisance to private or public infrastructure. I'm happy to take questions, Your Worship. Um, just as a quick flick because we haven't had many pictures, this is the typical thing we're seeing, Amelia tree breaking footpaths, uh, this is a tree lifting a curb and channel, changing the flow of stormwater, and you can see the footpath that's been replaced on the other side. Um, significant uh, row of trees um, down one side where there's community requests to work through. Um, this tree here, um, you may not be able to picture it, but in the back there, that's a sucker from the roots from this tree. And then obviously where trees are amelias and stuff going through. So again, lifting footpath. This footpath has already been replaced, um, but the tree roots continue to lift it. Just the tree is too big for the location it's in. Um, and in the many years ago when they were put in, they were, weren't put in with tree pits. Um, again, another curb. Um, these ones here also is wrong species, where A, it's created a lot of damage to the road and the island, but also creates quite a lot of mess with... Um, um, well. Pigeon droppings and so <laughs> forth. And yeah, you quite cool. <laughs> if you have questions, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, most of the uh, requests, um, you know, public contacting us just because they've got a niggly tree or whatever. I just wondered whether. I mean, there's obviously quite a few, um, but we don't really. Do we actively promote? Hey, got a niggly tree come to us type of situation. I'm just aware of the ones that we had in, and they would be in the program anyway. Um, not still um, over by Windsor Park area last late last year during the elections. The, the Louis Street uh, yeah. uh, drainage trees. Um, so um, officers can correct me if I'm wrong here. No, we don't actively promote if you don't like a tree come and see us. Um, <laughs> Ideally, if a tree is well and fit and isn't causing any nuisance, we want the trees to stay because we wouldn't be planting and having so many trees as a council otherwise. It's, it's more around responding to where community do make us aware of a nuisance or if it is creating a nuisance to public infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, apologies from Anne, who um, is also Chair of Eco Districts. Um, and we just wanted to make a comment um, around the fact that, in general, we haven't spoken about this in the committee, we haven't had time for that, but we don't oppose removal of trees and we have a level of confidence in the practical nature and assessment by staff, but we'd very much like to see the tree removal program not um, put again in isolation, as so many things are in our programs. Um, Anne and I have met with um, Professor Clarkson and the team from um, University of Waikato who are running the, um, through their Environmental Research Institute, the uh, Corporate Guardians for Hawke's Bay Biodiversity Programme that I know um, Bart's aware of, Regional Council and Napier are part of. We've been trying for the last couple of months to get a date settled for a workshop for them to join us so that Hastings Council can look at their part in the biodiversity programme. So we'd very much like to see the uh, tree removal programme 
again be connected with trees, what we're taking out, what we're replanting, and what we are planting is appropriate within our biodiversity programs so that we can start to grow capacity rather than just remove and possibly plant something else that isn't going to fit in the long-term plan. So I'm not sure. I think, Mr Cameron, sorry, put you on the spot. I should have um, perhaps asked you before. I'm not sure where that request has gone for the workshop on that biodiversity program, but maybe it could be tied to something within the change to this policy. Uh, I have two questions. <coughs> First one is, do we have an estimated cost of the damage or what we have to spend to rectify the damage to footpaths, curbs, pipes, et cetera, et cetera? Um, it varies. Oh, um, Thank you. Through you, um, Madam Chair, it, it varies from situation. And this very picture um, here to the right um, as an example where, yes, there's been um, two repairs of the uh, footpath, which is, might only come to a couple of thousand dollars, but also these elm trees in Russell Robertson have also um, got into the um, water tobies and water supply and required a far more extensive repair. And um, in at least three locations, there's been stormwater pipes that have actually been completely strangled and cut off, which has blocked neighbours. So it, it's, it's, we try to manage the things that if they're simple fixes straight away, then we do that. But some of them have got to the stage where we're going back, in particular with melias and some of those bigger trees that our our um, roading um, colleagues are going back every second year and replacing uh, when you start getting when the roots start getting out into the into the curb and channel, then you're starting to talk about thousands of dollars worth of repair. So it's probably um, in the vicinity of twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year, but that's ramping up, and we know that um, where there are problematic trees, that 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 issue is growing. So we're trying to be more proactive here and trying to. Um, get in and um, sort some of these issues out sooner rather than later. I don't have to be convinced that they're a problem. I do understand that. So is it our intention to, uh, with all replacement trees, to put them in the planter boxes as we have yes. been doing? So yes. that's what it's a policy. Yeah. Well, yeah. My only concern, because I, I think I support this, but um, yeah, yeah, trees are very emotive issues. And... Uh, I'm just wondering how we, because some trees are not a problem, do we wait until they're a problem and then cut them down, or do we anticipate they're going to be a problem and cut them down? How are we going to approach this? Okay, so the key issue there, and, I, and it is mentioned in the report, is um, <clears throat> there are some streets that have a lot of problematic trees. Well, trees that will, in time, become more and more problematic. What we're, what we're saying is, there will be street meetings on those streets, in particular Russell Robertson Drive. We've already met some people there um, uh, with, with Councillor uh, Dixon, where we had probably 20-odd, 20 25 residents. Um, but even within that meeting, there are those who are saying, yes, yes, get rid of them. But there are also those who said, these trees are magnificent in our street. We should be managing... Can we better manage it, or is it a case of you take out two or three that are really troublesome, you replace them in a tree pit so the streetscape is maintained? So this is not a case of um, we want to do a holus bolus um, clean out of trees. It's a very um, gradual process, um, and we've, we've uh, tried to give you a 10-year strategy that really heads off the worst of those. Mr Hospital, it would be appropriate to remind councillors of the um, decision-making flowchart on page 95, which actually guides how those decisions are made. Yeah, uh, which I think is entirely appropriate in this many stop-go kind of... Um, could, could I make just... Uh, thank you. Uh, and one, one, just one more comment. Some of these have been on um, the books for more than a few months, just quietly, and they have. Been, we've been managing and trimming and fixing and saying, 
we're sticking to the policy. We've, we've stuck to the policy, and as I know you're aware, we also have had members of the community who are um, very do not support any tree being um, taken to. So we've been very guarded in our response. But I guess what we're saying here is the calls from these com from some of these communities, and there is a petition that will come to you, has just arrived, which will come to you um, in a, in a meeting not too far off, which is about a whole street. And we've included, we included that knowing that um, these issues are in front of you. So we're trying to be proactive but also being, um, we're not talking about wholesale um, removal. Okay. Adam Chair, I think Mr Hosford actually answered the question I should have asked rather than the one I did ask, because that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dixon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just two questions from me. What guidance is given to people that are d developing now to ensure the right type of tree is planted in the right area? Because that's crucial. And the second question is, after being involved in the Russell Robinson one, and 20 people there, 10 wanted the trees out and 10 wanted the trees in. So what's the consultation process that takes place? Well, we can start with the, the first question. Yeah. We, um, council approves all tree planting plans, and under our code of practice, they must, all trees need to go, uh, need to be put in root containment for this very reason. Now, this... Um, some of these were done 30, 40 years ago, um, and, and, and they were just put in the ground. And um, Hawke's Bay soils are pretty good at growing uh, vegetation. Um, so we're pretty, we are comfortable that we've got um, policies and rules in place to cover them. Um, and in terms of tree selection, we work with them to try to ensure we get trees that are appropriate for residential streetscapes in particular. Um, and there's a, um, a list of trees, approved trees, which we know perform well, um, are well liked, um, and also mean that maintenance long term is minim minimised. In terms of street meetings, we would do typically on these streets, and where, for instance, we have a petition, there'll be a letter drop to all of the residents advising of a meeting. Um, in COVID level one, we can, we'll bring them in here and we will go through the issues that have been raised and talk about, um, let, let, talk about issues they've raised and look at options and hear from the people in the street to do our level best to get um, a firm majority. Um, just a comment, really. Um, and yes, I also have these. And can I just sort of give probably context for our new councillors. Um, uh, the Mayor, Jeremy Dwyer, had a vision for um, beautifying our city. In Hastings, we grow beautiful, beautiful trees. And, but, you know, lots of trees were planted at the time, tw over 20 years ago, and they were probably planted, as you say in the report, too closely together. And now they're very, very large trees, and, and some trees are more suited to residential areas than others. So I support the direction. Um, and just just to let you know that, you know, perhaps it would be really helpful if landmarks were involved in, in, in any of our direction as well, because this, this is really important to them. Thank you. Can you get the chainsaw out? Uh, <laughs> the chainsaw out. No, I, 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 you know, I've, I've, I've actually just cut five trees down on my property just because of that, that uh, they're about 16 years old, and you actually have to be proactive. I think if you wait until they're 30, 40 years old, I mean, that's way too big. And the cost of actually doing stuff with a tree that big is just huge. So um, I support I support the uh, the direction and plan that, that, that's going through there. And I think um, we take a tree down, we plant another tree and, you know, manage it as, as, as we should. Get all of it. Um, thank you. I will keep this brief because I realise I've spoken too much today. Um, uh, thank you for the report and thank you. Um, I support the direction. Um, my only little bit of feedback would be um, I too have had a number of calls from constituents in my various terms on council uh, regarding trees. And the common theme seems to be that 
in many cases, the constituent doesn't necessarily actually disagree with the tree removal. They disagree with the lack of amenity that's left thereafter. And sometimes there is a gap between planting a new tree after taking down a beautiful, well-established tree, or perhaps the new tree is very, very small compared to the, the beautiful one that was there before. Um, so my request is, in a couple of these situations, Mr Hosford, you've helped me, um, in one in particular, where we were able to stagger the removal of trees and replanting um, to the benefit of that constituent. They were very happy to support it if they knew that there wasn't suddenly going to be a bare street and then tiny trees. There was a bit of a staggered removal. So I, if I can just endorse that um, continued pragmatism um, when it comes to removal, that would be great. Yes, you mentioned um, new tree plantings being in boxes for root construction. Are there any other um, covenants on such as the type of tree uh, that can be replanted or replanted uh, with respect to litter, um, seeds, etc., etc. Yes, there are. We've basically, we're looking to re-establish the tree stock, particularly in the streets, with species that don't produce a lot of leaf and debris uh, and create headaches. Um, a lot of obviously large deciduous trees such as liquid amber, melia, and um, you know silver birch. There's a whole raft of trees that are better suited to parks than streets. Yep. And so it's about re-establishing and uh, improving and enhancing our urban tree stocks with with more suitable, more appropriate species and. Sp and species that don't have really aggressive root systems like liquid amber that just blow the place apart. And when, when they don't have any form of root containment, like a lot of our problematic species that are part of this batch, um, then, yeah, it, it, it is a costly thing to correct. And what is the situation with property owners who plant trees on their own property that could be roots damaging um, council infrastructure? Typically, I'll be blunt, our traffic engineers will probably go through their root structure pretty quickly when they're repairing the um, footpath. Um, fortunately, we don't have um, a heck of a lot that actually, it's, it's a good point, but we would talk to those neighbours that we're going to have to replace a footpath or a section of footpath and that we would cut their roots back to the boundary which we are entitled to do. It doesn't solve the long-term problem, though. No, no, it, does, it doesn't. It doesn't, no. Um, now, we did have a, uh, we were looking at a certain state Uh, after close of play last night, rather than the ones in the original document. So I'm going to take some assurance of that, thank you, uh, and I'm going to put those recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Uh, contrary view, thank you, and yes, just following on from Mr Hosford's comments, yes, we have received a, um, a petition from residents and the Sells Street to have all their trees uh, removed, uh, and we're just noting that that has come in, and Mrs. Miss Evans is going to respond to that as appropriate. Thank you. Now moving on to item number eleven, and I'm going to invite Mr. Stockart to come forward. It's the application for a temporary alcohol ban. Happy to move the recommendation, Madam Chair. Thank you. And do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Sears. Are there any questions? There being none, I'm going to put the motion. All those... Oh, Councillor Ollie. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, uh, mine's just a, a, a comment. Um, in support, I, I support the recommendations and the direction for this item um, to adopt the police request for a temporary alcohol ban. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. As I once resided on the corner of Henry Street and Southland Road, um, where 
On many occasions, I had discovered magically wine and beer bottles had grown in our front garden. I also, on many occasions, had to break up fights between individuals and street signs. So, yeah, I totally support the purpose of the request. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Happy to second. Thank you, and I'm going to put, put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary view, no. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. And item 12, the quarterly health and safety report. We're just going to have to behave at your clock. Dia Koto, thank you. Um, I take the report largely as read, uh, but I will happily take any questions. And I did want to point out that the report covers a period of time where council operations were heavily impacted by COVID. And therefore, uh, the report is quite light. I acknowledge that. And um, obviously, a lot of our objectives weren't met during that time, but we are diligently working on them now. Questions? Happy to move, Chair. Thank you. And a seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. There being no further discussion, I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Uh, contrary? Carried. Thank you. Now, item 13, Animal Control Annual Report. Mr. Payne. Good afternoon. Um, do you remember last year when? If I remember last year when I um, presented the report, we were right in the middle of a, a spate of dog attacks. Um, those are captured in this report because it fell into this financial year. So hence you'll see um, an increase in animal attacks and an increase in um, some, some legal activity that we took. Otherwise, you can see this, the, the minor impacts of COVID and some of them are actually probably not too bad. Less roaming, less parking. Any questions? Questions? Through you, Madam Chair, just a question, John. Um, just under 4.1, so uh, in terms of the whole um, stock attacks that we witnessed, um, so the total legal costs it costs us to undertake this procedure, this process, and the awarding to the dog owners the stock and the stock owners and the fines of 4200 um, those legal costs come and how does that work in terms of how much does that cost the ratepayer? Uh, well, not much of it comes from the ratepayer because most of the animal control is funded by dog registration. So it comes out of there. Um, that 29 is not the end of it either because we still have some cases that are pending. Right. Um, there was some reparation awarded, but it was di done directly from the insurance company, between the insurance company and the dog owner, right. so the, the courts didn't get, get involved. Um, and there were a number of dogs that were actually destroyed on the spot and, and no owners held accountable. So but, yeah, the return, the fine recoveries, mm -hmm. is, um, it's not, is not very healthy. But I, no. I guess at the end of the day, when you've got a, a dog owner who gets charged $4,000 in reparation, there's not much left to charge them for a fine. So, so what is the total cost to council to the operations of the dog control to, um, de to deal with this this challenging issue? Th that would have to be quite a quite a program to work out because a lot of staff time and a lot of um, keeping the dog, uh, you know, mm -hmm. pending the outcome of the prosecution. So there's there's the feeding and um, unfortunately with the amount of uh, activity that we had going on, we nearly had about a quarter of our pound for the whole year out of action because it was holding a dog, oh. um, which made things quite difficult actually because we can only house about 40 dogs. Mm. 
So um, the cost um, would be significantly more than 29,000, and, and as I said, the 29,000 is not the end of it yet. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, John. Um, just a point of clarification in terms of dog prohibited areas, and I'm just going to ask for clarification about Frimley Park, where half the park's a sports field, so no dogs. Of the other half, probably 10% has child's play area. So the other portion of that half, that is a dog on lease area because signs say no dogs. And it's just, I, I just need to understand because the park has three, three layers to it. Unfortunately, sometimes the signs don't match the bylaw, um, and I'm not sure who puts them up. But um, uh, my understanding is that, like all sports fields, are, uh, no dogs allowed. Yes. All um, designated children's playground areas, no dogs allowed. Yeah. But generally, the rest of it is dogs are are allowed. They're either permitted on lead or they're free running. Thank but you. That, that's all I need, John. Thank you. And, and the Chief will take an action if uh, we've got signs that are inconsistent with bylaws. Um, we'll get on and get that fixed. <laughs> 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 Thank you. We have two recommendations on page 107. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those, please? Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Watkins. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mayor Hazelhurst. And I'm going to put those two motions. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary? Aye. Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. And moving now down to our um, levels of service for the libraries and art gallery. Thank you, Ms. Murdoch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ahia uh, Koto Katoa. I know it's been a long meeting. You've saved the best till last, and you're nearly there. Indeed. Um, so I just wanted to um, separately identify the um, plans to restore libraries and art gallery to pre-COVID levels of service. I understand that some councillors have been receiving uh, feedback uh, on the level of service that is being provided currently. So both services have been impacted by the need to boost staffing levels uh, to enable all facilities to open safely and then be able to offer programs and activities beyond that. So we've taken quite a phased approach. It was a very uh, gentle opening uh, back in May for one library. Um, and we've been working around the level of staffing that we've had available as well as the COVID level restrictions. Um, in terms of libraries specifically, um, boosting staffing levels for libraries has in fact been made possible by financial support from central government. Um, we have... Uh, um, been able to tap into a financial support package for New Zealand public libraries that was announced by the Honourable Tracy Martin, the Minister of Internal Affairs, back in June. And that's um, been able to be tapped into in two ways. So we've got credit back on products that we purchase from the National Library of New Zealand, and that's funded two roles uh, through until June 2022. Uh, we'll also be able to uh, fund two further roles uh, directly from that funding from the DIA through the National Library uh, until June 2022. Um, and we're at the, at the step in the process at the moment where I'm about to um, send back our application for those two roles so that we can actually hit the go button on recruiting them. And we hope to have those um, in place hopefully by November sometime. Uh, we have been given a heads up that it may be possible for us to apply for funding for two further roles um, in, in a later stage of the rollout of this funding. Um, and we are very interested in, in pursuing that because it will enable us to complete an RFID project um, in the current financial year. So just um, so you're aware, we're in the process of securing that funding from DIA and we hope to appoint um, some, more, some more roles by November. 
that will enable the libraries to return to full Saturday service um, from this weekend. So um, we're back to our 10 till 4 opening across all three libraries this weekend. And from mid-October, there will be two, two weekday late nights, and previously we had one. Um, so what we've done is actually uh, incorporate some of the feedback we had from stakeholder engagement that we did late last year for our strategic plan review. Um, and the feedback from community was very clearly focused on more hours and longer hours of opening for libraries. Uh, so we're incorporating two late nights uh, from mid-October to time it with the uh, uh, term four of the academic year. Um, Sunday opening at the Hastings Library uh, will begin from early next year, um, as outlined in the report. And um, we're also looking at some um, options to align gallery and library hours of opening on a Sunday, so we're considering the implications of that. In terms of the gallery, uh, the gallery hours are currently from Tuesday to Saturday, and we uh, need to undertake some recruitment to be able to return to full pre-COVID hours, um, which were across seven days. We did note that gallery visitation was particularly high after lockdown and it has settled into quite a new normal, but what we're finding is that school visitation is particularly high at the moment. Um, we have been uh, attracting new schools to the gallery, a lot of rural schools, and the exhibitions have also been really well received by the community. And I think that reflects um, both on the curation. We have appointed a new curator in the middle of lockdown. Um, so uh, his work is, is being appreciated by the community. But it also um, ref reflects on the work of our gallery educator um, who is able to tap into the exhibitions that are being shown and actually blend them into the curriculum in a way that's useful for schools and easy for them to, to come along to. Um, Returning to seven-day opening at the gallery is a target uh, following our re-roof. Uh, so we're not aiming to get there until we've actually uh, got the... A, we've got the staffing, and B, we've got all the um, building site out of the way. And we now um, understand that that building work will be completed by the middle of November. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, the community has indicated that it would like to see the Hastings Library and the gallery hours better aligned, so um, there are some implications for us to be able to achieve that. Um, through you, I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor Sears. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the report. I'm hugely relieved we'll be open. I'm from Wellington, and the library was our best place in the whole world, and my parents were publishers, and the Hastings Library was, we used to drive past, my boy who's 21 now, as we drove, he used to put his hands on the window and say, that is my favourite building in the world. I honestly <coughs> think we lived there, and on those seven o'clock nights we had, you know, because we live at Waimarama, the nights we'd spent in there while someone was at ballet or somewhere reading, it's just really, really important to us. So I, you know, was very... Um, uh, very distressed at the um, at the idea that we could be closed for much longer. Uh, I do, and I do agree. I think those hours are great. Last year, my daughter da uh, danced from five to half past six. I used to spend Tuesday five to six in the Havelock Law, um, North Library, like my own private time. And um, I can honestly tell you, it really was private because I think mostly I was the only one. So I loved it. So I think the hours you've chosen are great. So my question, I am getting there is I am just a little bit sorry that the art gallery is still um, remaining closed on the Sunday. And you do make the note that historically um, the gallery and library opening hours on Sunday haven't been well aligned. Um, and the feedback, are you saying that that's about the two being open together or also the feedback was that Sunday wasn't a great day for the gallery? Because I thought it was quite busy on Sundays. I would have thought that was our most important Said then Sunday would be our most important days. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, certainly Sundays are a busy day at the gallery. Um, what, I, what I was suggesting was that the library is open one till four on a Sunday um, pre COVID. Um, the gallery has always been open 10 till 4 30. And it, it just seemed like an opportunity to see whether we can actually line them up a little bit better because there are some implications in terms of kaitiaki staffing. 
Right, but at this stage, you still the 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 gallery is still um, not not on for opening on Sunday in the near future. Through Madam Chair, that's that's correct. At this point, we have um, we have to fill a vacancy before we can go to to opening on Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. Um, <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sears has, has pretty much covered what I was I was thinking about. Um, and, and I just think we need to move as fast as we can to get Sunday's opening at the library. Um, it is, it's an absolutely important part of our community, never before actually, uh, post-COVID. Um, and to read those comments about that, you know, after coming out of level lockdown and the man trying to get on the internet to find a job, you know, that's what our libraries, they're far more than just, you know, going to collect books. So, you know, this, this is a... This is, if anything, was a um, COVID response, our libraries are COVID response, um, and they're an integral part of, of the wellbeing of our people. So, um, you know, thank you for, you know, what we're doing, but, I, you know, I can't wait to be able to get to see those, see the library open again on a Sunday. Thank you. We have two recommendations on page 115, oh, sorry, one recommendation on page 115. I have a mover and seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Barber. Thank you, Councillor Sears. I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Uh, contrary? No? Carried. Thank you. Now, uh, the final item on our agenda is the uh, requests under uh, the <coughs> Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act. Ms Evans, do you want to speak to that? Page 121. Um, I have nothing to add. No. Thank you. And a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Shollam. I'm going to put that motion to receive uh, off from page 121. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Thank you. Contrary view? No. Thank you. Carried. And I'm just going to finish with a benediction. Kua mutu a mato mahi mō tene wā manakitanga mai mato katoa o mato hoa o mato fano. I all key Ted Aurangi. Our work has finished for the moment. Bless us all, our colleagues, our families. Peace to the universe. Thank you for your attendance. And if there are people who have some suggestions as to how things could have gone better or things that they particularly appreciated, I